Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, I'm looking at the topic of religious Zionism. Um, so, in my view, it's very important for us as Muslims to have a more comprehensive theological understanding of what is happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis Palestine. And when I say a more comprehensive theological uh, understanding, I mean from an Islamic standpoint, a Jewish standpoint, and a Christian standpoint. It's time for us to uh, expand our knowledge base. Knowledge is power. In my opinion, uh, we will not truly understand what's happening in Palestine right now unless we sharpen our understandings of Jewish and Christian theology. So this is just a fact. Um, let me move my slides here. But first and foremost, we need to consider this calamity this musiba within the framework of the Quran and Sunnah. <clears throat> if we're Muslims, uh, nothing should take precedence over the Quran and Sunnah. I shouldn't even have to say that. Nothing should take precedence over the Quran and Sunnah, not Foucault, not Marx, not Mao, not uh, liberalism, not nationalism, not communism, and certainly not some critical theory or postmodern philosophy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us <clears throat> that if we should disagree, about anything, to refer it back to him and his messenger. If we believe in Allah in the last day, That is the best and most beautiful resolution. When we as professed Muslims put anything before Allah and his messenger, this is when the fitna happens. This is when fitna happens, giving precedence and priority to anything over Allah and His Messenger is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is when fitna happens. This is the sunnah of Allah with the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْإِقَابِ And protect yourselves against a fitna which does not exclusively befall those uh, who did injustice among you and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe in punishment. So this is the nature of this world, injustice and oppression uh, committed by certain uh, individuals or groups or governments can lead to the suffering of masses, the innocent like the people of Gaza. They are innocent. Now what about وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزْرَ أُخْرَى and no bearer of burdens bears the burden of another. Yes, uh, according to our teachers, this statement is referring to the Akhirah. In this world, we suffer the consequences of our sins. Uh, uh, sorry, we suffer the consequences of the sins of those who came before us. This happens all the time. This is happening now. If I, you know, commit murder, a'udhu billah, and I go to prison, my wife and kids will suffer due to my sin. They are innocent of my sin as far as spiritual accountability is concerned, but their lives in this dunya will be turned upside down because they will inherit the consequences of my sin. They will inherit the consequences of my bad decision. That's on me, not them, but in this world they will suffer. If political leadership or people in positions of power or influence or even just individuals make bad decisions, Innocent people could end up suffering and dying. This is simply what happens in the dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in the Quran, لا يتخذ المؤمنون الكافرين أولياء من دون المؤمنين Believers should not take disbelievers as allies instead of the believers. وَمَا يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَلَيْسَ مِنَ اللَّهِ فِي شَيْءٍ And whoever does so has nothing to do with Allah. Unless it is a precaution of some sort against their tyranny. And Allah warns you about Himself. And Allah warns you about Himself. And to Allah is the final return. How much have the Palestinians suffered for the injustices committed by others? How much have the people of Gaza, in particular, suffered for the injustices committed by others? They inherited the consequences of these sinful actions, the disobedient actions of non-Muslims and other Muslims. But here's the reality 
في حقيقة إن الله إذا أحب قوما ابتلاهم When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people, he tests them. This is amazing. The disobedience of some people leads to difficult conditions in the world, okay, through which Allah will demonstrate his love for another people. The disobedience of some people leads to difficult conditions in the world through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will demonstrate his love for other people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always in charge. Ya Rasulullah, ayyu nas ashaddu bala'an. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Messenger of God, uh, which of the people is tried most severely? Qala al-anbiya. He said, the prophets. Thumma al-amthalu fal-amthal. The prophets, then those nearest to them, then those nearest to them. 106 years of oppression, 106 years of trials and tribulations. That tells me that the Palestinian people are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them the prophetic treatment, that Allah is raising their ranks in His sight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is purifying their souls in this world, and inshallah they'll have great stations, high stations, in the akhirah. How many non-Muslims have we heard of recently who have been absolutely uh, smitten and floored, uh, flabbergasted by the faith of the Palestinian people? Also Muslims have been floored. How many people have fallen in love with the Palestinian people? How many people have the Palestinians inspired to read the Quran? People are converting to Islam by seeing the responses of the people of Gaza to their tribulations. They cannot believe what they're seeing. A man holding his dead little girl in his arms, saying, Alhamdulillah, this is the Qadr of Allah. A woman walking around with blood on her hands, saying, I've lost my children. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Oh Allah, accept them in your presence. <clears throat> A father telling his weeping, surviving son, they're with Allah. Am I wrong? They're with Allah, referring to the rest of his murdered family. Uh, an absolutely overwhelmed hospital staff taking a short break and reciting salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. A 13-year-old girl trapped under rubble with her parents and siblings and asking her rescuers to help them first. Help my parents and my siblings, she says, then me. A 13-year-old girl, that's a 13-year-old girl. What's a 13-year-old doing in this society? A little boy, he looked like he was eight years old, who said that when he was trapped under the rubble in the darkness, he turned and he saw an angel and then turned his face and saw his rescuers. I believe him. Did you hear about this one? This happened in America. Some privileged Zionist college student at Yale University took to social media. Do you know why? The university cafeteria at Yale removed the word Israeli from the menu item Israeli couscous. She was outraged. What a victim. Meanwhile in Gaza, doctors and besieged hospitals are forced to amputate the limbs of crushed, uh, the crushed limbs of children without anesthesia. There was a young boy in Gaza, maybe 10 years old, <clears throat> who was getting his head stitched up by a doctor. There was a gash in his head, maybe 10 years old. Do you know what he did to suppress the pain? He started reciting the Quran. So this is what we read about in books, the stories of the Salihin, the stories of the Awliya. What causes fitna? Disobedience and disunity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands from us unity. We're always asking, when will our conditions change? It'll change when we actualize this verse and take it to heart, when Allah, His Messenger, and the believers become our only ally. Notice here, wali is in the singular. Innama waliyukum Allah. Warrasuluhu. Walladina amanu. Singular, to emphasize a unity of purpose, a unity of conviction. We will come out of this quagmire only when our only source of hope is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we turn exclusively to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we make tawbah and turn back to the Quran and Sunnah, وَعَتَسِمُوا بِحَبِلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
uh, hold on all of you to the rope of Allah, which according to the hadith is the Quran, all of you, wala tafarraqu, and do not be divided. وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَسْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا And remember the blessing of God upon you when you were enemies, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala united your hearts and you became, by means of His ni'mah, brethren. And the ulama mentioned here, the ni'mah, the mentioned here is a reference to the Prophet ﷺ. By means of the Prophet ﷺ, you became brethren. So what do we gather from this ayah? Adherence to Quran and Sunnah leads to ta'lif of the qulub. Adherence to Quran and Sunnah leads to unification of the hearts and akhawiya bayn al mu'minin and brotherhood and sisterhood among the believers. And then a change in our external conditions will come. Our izzah is through Islam, nothing else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept anything else from us. You think because you were born into a Muslim family, you can just stroll into Jannah, slide into Jannah on skates. No, you have to work, you have to prioritize. As individual Muslims, we look first to the state of our own hearts. Our own actions should concern us a lot more than the actions of others. We need to ask ourselves, how is our prayer? Are we praying five times a day at the proper times? Bain al kufri wal iman tarkus salah. The difference between faith and kufr is leaving the prayer. One of my teachers said that non praying Muslims are low hanging fruit for the Dajjal, the imposter Messiah. Who's coming? We'll see here. How's our prayer? How's our zakat? How's our income? Is it halal? How are we treating people? Are we physically, verbally, emotionally, psychologically abusing people? Uh, are we doing that to our own families? Are we protecting our tongues, our eyes, our ears? Do we attack other Muslims or even Muslim scholars that we don't see eye to eye with? Do we have hubbul mal, hubbul jah, hubbul shuhra, right? Love of, of, of wealth, love of station or rank, love of fame. We have to be honest with ourselves. In Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not change the condition of a people until they change what is within themselves. And if Allah wants some evil for a people, there is no turning it back, and apart from Him, they have no guardian. This is the Quranic perspective, and it is tough on the nafs. It is tough on the nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands so much more from us. Allah commands a high standard for us. Inna Allah katab al-ihsan ala kulli shay. Allah demands from us excellence in all things. Jannah takes struggle. Okay. Okay, so with that said, what is Zionism? So broadly speaking, Zionism is a, mo a modern, secular, nationalistic movement aimed at reestablishing a Jewish homeland. It is a movement to create a Jewish ethno-state. It was born in Europe. European anti-Semitism gave birth to Zionism. So historically, the Jews had a very difficult time in Christian-dominated countries in Europe. This is just a fact. This is, this is not a controversial statement. There were pogroms, exiles, uh, massacres, uh, blood libels. The plague was blamed on them at one point. All of this culminated in the uh, so-called final solution to the Jewish problem, the Holocaust, which is a Greek word meaning a whole burnt offering. In Hebrew, it's called Hashoah. The Jewish experience in the Muslim world, however, uh, was very different historically. Muslim Spain, Muslim North Africa, Muslim Palestine, Generally, there was peace, prosperity, uh, tolerance, brotherhood, trust, not to mention incredible scholarship. Jewish systematic theology was born in Muslim lands. Maimonides wrote in Judeo-Arabic, his magnum opus called Dalalat al-Ha'irin. He wrote in Judeo-Arabic, The Guide for the Perplexed. This is studied at Al-Azhar University. Sadia Gayon wrote his masterpiece, uh, The Book of Beliefs and Opinions in Judeo-Arabic. That's Arabic with Hebrew letters. In 135 of the Common Era, in the wake of the failed Bar Kokhba rebellion, uh, this is one of these pseudo-messianic movements. The Roman Emperor Hadrian expelled the Jews from Jerusalem and renamed the city Aelia Capitolina after his clan Aelius 
and his god, Jupiter Capitolinus. The Jews were not permitted to return and live in the city until the Muslims reopened that door for them in the 7th century, the Khulafa Rashidun. The Muslims called uh, that city Al-Quds al-Sharif, essentially the Holy Land. The Quran calls Palestine literally Al-Ardu uh, al al-Muqaddasa, the Holy Land. The so-called father of uh, Zionism, Theodore Herzl, was an ethnically Jewish atheist. I always point out the irony here, right? Theodore means gift of God, and he was an atheist. Of course, he wrote the famous uh, treatise, Der Judenstaat, the Jewish state in 1896. According to Herzl, Jewish assimilation in Christian-dominated Europe was not possible, just not possible. Jews needed a state of their own. And so Herzl was seriously considering Argentina as being the uh, Jewish homeland. So Herzl, being, a, uh, or being the secular atheist that he was, did not have this romantic attachment to Palestine. Uganda was also floating around as a Jewish homeland or Jewish national state, nation state. Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland. Now, the vast majority of religious Jews before World War II were vehemently anti-Zionist. In the early 1920s, Rabbi Joseph Chaim Sonnenfeld founded an organization in Jerusalem called the Aida Haradit, Aida Haradit, the Congregation of the God-Fearers. So the Haredim, or Haredi Jews, are often referred to as the ultra-Orthodox or the strictly orthodox, I call them the traditional orthodox, the traditional orthodox. The word Haredi uh, comes from the Tanakh, the book of Isaiah. When God describes the righteous man, he says, uh, Hared al-Devari, the one who trembles at my word. Uh, a, a Christian group called the Society of Friends uh, are also called the Quakers for the same reason. They, they quake, they tremble when they hear the word of God. This actually reminds me of the Quranic description of the righteous, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَقْشَئِرُّ مِنْهُ جُلُودَ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ The skins of those who fear the Lord tremble from it, from the Quran, when they hear the Quran. Okay, so Sonnenfeld became the chief rabbi of the Aida Haradit, the congregation of the God-fearers, the congregation of the tremblers, in Jerusalem in the very late 19th century. This is what Rabbi Sonnenfeld had to say about Zionism. And Theodore Herzl in 1898, one year after the first Zionist Congress. With regards to the Zionist, with regards to the Zionists, what am I to say? What am I to speak? There is a great dismay also here, also in the Holy Land, that these evil men who deny the unique one of the world and his holy Torah have proclaimed with so much publicity that it is in their power to hasten redemption for the people of Israel and gather to disperse from all the ends of the earth. They've also asserted their view that the whole difference and distinction between Israel and the nations lies in nationalism, blood, and race, and that the faith and the religion are superfluous. Dr. Herzl comes not from the Lord, but from the side of pollution. And here's just two very different men. On the left, you have Rabbi Sonnenfeld, the founder of the Eda Haradit, anti-Zionist rabbi, a just man, and on the right, you have the father of Zionism, Theodor Herzl, ethnically Jewish atheist. Okay. And Sonnenfeld's uh, comments was indicative of the general sentiment of religious Jews at that time. So the first major problem with Zionism from a traditional Orthodox perspective is that it changes the very essence of what it means to be a Jew. So before Zionism, the essence of Jewishness was Torah observance, which of course was rooted in the fear of the Lord. There's a famous verse in uh, Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 10, where it says, uh, the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? I mean, this was the, the essence, uh, the johar of being a Jew. The revered medieval scholar, sage, theologian and exeget, Rav Sadia Gayon, he famously said, our nation is not a nation except in its Torahs. So he was referring to the written Torah, the Tanakh or Hebrew Bible, Christians call it the Old Testament, and the oral Torah, the Talmud, which is Mishnah and Gemara, i.e. the tradition, the Torah and its tradition. So these two are called HaTorah Min HaShemayim, the instruction from heaven. 
Now, obviously, as Muslims, we don't agree with much of what is written in the Torah and the Talmud, but that is not the point. We want people to be Muslim, obviously, first and foremost, but if they're not going to become Muslim, then we should encourage faith communities to at least adhere to their long-standing tradition. These traditions are tried and tested. They represent the sum of the contributions of thousands upon thousands of brilliant minds. If you are Jewish, Zionism is indefensible according to your long-standing tradition. So according to Rav Sadia Gaon, according to the statement, it is only a common faith that unites the Jews. Not a common language, not a common culture, not a common land, but a common religion, okay, which is called Judaism. And at the heart of Judaism is the Torah and its tradition. So forsake religion and you forsake the essence of Jewishness. Secular Zionism throws the Torah and its tradition in the garbage and redefines a Jew purely along racial lines. The rabbis point out that the word Jew in Hebrew, Yehuda, contains the four letters of the Shem HaMaforash, the sacred name of God, yad heh vav -Heh. Thus the Yehudim are supposed to be the people of God, the people of Hashem. Zionism, as a settler colonial project, was founded by atheists. I think it was Ilan Pape, the famous Israeli historian, who once quipped, very funny, most uh, Zionists don't believe that God exists, but they do believe that he promised them Palestine. <laughs> so for the Zionists, the essence of Jewishness was Jewish ethnicity, mm -hmm. the Jewish race. For the Zionists, religion was more uh, cultural, not essential. The law of return in Israel to this day demonstrates this. If you are an atheist, but Jewish by race, you can make aliyah. You can immigrate to Israel. You can immigrate to Israel as an atheist. Well, Sam Harris or Bill Maher, if they wanted to, <laughs> they can make aliyah to Israel. It's race over devotion. But even here, they contradict themselves. Let's say that both of your parents are descendants of Aaron. In other words, you're 100% Jewish, a Levite, a descendant of Kohanim, but you converted to Islam. You are not allowed to make Aliyah. So they want ethnic Jews, but not all ethnic Jews. Now, after Rabbi Sonnenfeld's death in 1932, Rabbi Yosef Dushinsky became the chief rabbi of the Eide Haradit in Jerusalem. In 1947, Dushinsky wrote to the newly formed United Nations, and famously said, quote, we express our definite opposition to a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. So here on the left, you have Rabbi Dushinsky. And on the right, you have very famous Rav Sadia Gaon. The Torah is central to Jewish identity. Essence of Judaism is the fear of the Lord. Okay. Now, another very influential Orthodox rabbi was named Abraham Isaac Kook, K-O-O-K, -O -O and he was living in Palestine in the 20th century. Kook was one of the major founders of something called religious Zionism. This is an actual term. In Hebrew, it's known as uh, Tzionot Datit. The followers of religious Zionism are called Dati Ummi, the national religious. Okay, the so-called national religious see no contradiction between Zionism and Orthodox Judaism. Rabbi Kook in 1920 was declared chief rabbi of all Palestine during, during British mandate. He was the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of all of Palestine under British mandate. The Haradim, they considered Kook's rabbinate to be a farce, fraudulent, not to mention highly blasphemous for reasons I'll explain shortly. Kook founded the famous Merkaz Harav in 1924, the so-called universal yeshiva. Yeshiva means seminary, the universal Jewish seminary. The Merkaz Harav became, and still is, the most famous pro-Zionist orthodox yeshiva in the world. According to their own official website, they describe themselves with the following words. The mother of Zionistic yeshivot, the very first Zionist yeshiva, and the flagship for Dati La Ummi, the national religious community. So they're very proud of themselves. 
Kook saw Zionism as a way, a means, or we might say a stepping stone by which God was going to bring about the Jewish redemption under the Messiah. Now, Kook's son, Yehuda Kook, presided over the Merkaz Harav for six decades until his death in 1982. At the Merkaz, thousands of Jews have been indoctrinated into Kookian Zionism. So according to Kookian Zionism, the state of Israel will eventually bring about the emergence of the Messiah. The state of Israel constitutes what's known as the Hatchalat Hagaula, the beginning of the redemption. This is how they justified Israel's legitimacy. So the nationalist, secular, divisive, ethnic cleansing, and highly irreligious state of Israel is preparing the way for the Messiah. <laughs> this is the claim now. According to Kook, God promised the Holy Land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it is the duty of the descendants of these three men to initiate a return to the Holy Land, to seize the Holy Land, to, and implement the various mitzvot commandments that are particular to the Holy Land. And we'll talk about these mitzvot. And then eventually, Mashiach Hamelech ben David, the, the King Messiah, son of David, will come and rule the world from Jerusalem. Now, after World War II, after the Holocaust in particular, many Orthodox rabbis in Europe began changing their minds about the Zionist movement. There was a major shift. They now started considering the Zionist project. They started considering religious Zionism in light of the Holocaust. And unlike Herzl and other secular Zionists, European rabbis did have a strong emotional attachment to Palestine. And so Zionist ideas were eventually appropriated by the Orthodox community and given a religiously sanctioned makeover, like what Kook did. They took lessons from him. So, to put it bluntly, Zionism is a hijacking of Orthodox Judaism. From the traditional Orthodox, sorry, for the traditional Orthodox, this was enormously blasphemous at best and rank apostasy at worst, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But here is, on the left, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Kook, the founder of the National Religious in Palestine, and the so-called Chief Rabbi of Palestine. And on the right, you have a photograph from the inside of his Merkaz Harav. Today, there are three major divisions of Western Jews, okay, European and North American Jewry, Reform, Conservative, and Modern Orthodox. Okay, and Modern Orthodox is also called Neo-Orthodox. So modern orthodoxy is not the same as traditional orthodoxy. There are some differences. Modern orthodoxy tries to harmonize sacred knowledge with secular knowledge. This is also called Torah Umadda. The Haredi, the traditional orthodox, the Haredim, find this problematic. Rabbi Samson Hirsch, who died in 1888, was one of the main influencers of modern orthodoxy. Uh, he was the founder of what's known as the Torah im Derech Eretz movement, Torah with the way of the land. Rabbi uh, uh, David Weiss, one of the anti-Zionist uh, rabbis of Natura Karta, he said that modern orthodoxy is, quote, a euphemism for compromised Judaism. In terms of Zionism, modern orthodox Jews tend to be very devoted and zealous Zionists, whereas traditional orthodox tend to be either non-Zionist or anti-Zionist. And one of the major influencers of the worldview of modern Orthodox Jews was none other than Abraham Isaac Kook. Now, I said earlier that the vast majority of religious Jews before World War II were vehemently anti-Zionist. Why were they anti-Zionist? One major reason, as I stated, was because Zionism, as conceived of by Herzl, shifted the focus of Jewish identity from one of religion to ethnicity. Right? We said that. Another reason was more theological in nature. So before the blasphemy of religious Jewish Zionism, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, almost 2,000 years, Jews the world over believed, based upon explicit texts in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, that their exile from the Holy Land was justified. It was divinely decreed due to their disobedience, Jewish disobedience. 
This is the traditional understanding. In other words, the Holy Land, right, the Promised Land, was given on condition. So this is extremely important. It was conditional. Obey God, or else the land will reject you, and God will thrust you out. This is stated dozens of times in the Tanakh, in various books, Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, for, uh, for example, Jeremiah 16, 13, Therefore I will cast you out of this land and into a land that you do not know. Deuteronomy 28, 63, You will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess. This is called a wa'id, a threat. There are dozens of threats like this from God in the Tanakh. Ezekiel 33, 24-26, Ezekiel said, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, the people living in those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed the land. But we are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. Therefore say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Since you eat meat with the blood still in it, and you look to your idols and shed blood, should you then possess the land? So this is a rhetorical question. Ha'aretz tirashu? Should you then possess the land? In other words, because you sinned against God, God will cause you to dispossess the land. It continues, you rely on your sword, you do detestable things, and each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Should you then possess the land? So according to traditional Judaism, no one other than God, by means of the Messiah, can initiate a return to the Holy Land. No one other than God by means of the Messiah, can reestablish a Jewish nation, kingdom, or homeland. And the Messiah has yet to come for the Jews. They, they must wait for the Messiah. So the Jews are under a 2,000-year divinely mandated diaspora. Okay, this is what all Jews believed prior to 150 years ago. This is traditional Judaism. Any attempt to reestablish any land through military means in lieu of the Messiah was viewed as rebellion against God. Any land, even if there's some uninhabited island the size of a football stadium in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Jewish people have no right to it whatsoever, according to traditional orthodoxy, the Haredim, not the Zionist so-called orthodox heretics. Now, the Haredim further cite what's known as the Three Oaths, the Shalosh Shavuot. This is found in the Talmud. It's based upon a book in the Old Testament called the Shira Hashirim, the, book of, uh, the Song of Solomon, the, the Song of Songs, also called. The Charedim, they charge the national religious and the Kukian Zionists with breaking these oaths. The first two oaths relate to the Yehudim, the Jews, and the third to the Goyim, the Gentiles. So oath number one, we will not return en masse to the Holy Land. In other words, Jews cannot make any attempt to end the exile. This includes establishing some temporary Jewish state or kingdom outside of the Holy Land. The Jews must continue to live in exile as long as God wants. And how do they know when enough is enough? Well, God sends the Messiah. So remember what Rabbi Dushinsky, what he said to the UN, we express our definite opposition to a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. Oath number two, we will not rebel against any nation. In other words, Jews must be loyal citizens of any host nation, if, uh, even if they are oppressing them. The traditional Orthodox say that if some oppressive Gentile king is oppressing and humiliating you because you're Jewish, they say, thank God, thank Hashem at that moment. Thank God that you are being oppressed and you are not the oppressor. Number three, the nations will not oppress the Jews excessively. In other words, there will never, it'll never be too much to handle. It'll never justify a premature man-initiated ending of exile and return to the Holy Land. Nothing justifies ending the exile without Mashiach, without the Messiah. The famous Satma Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, the founder of the highly anti-Zionist Satmar Hasidic dynasty, he said, that the Holocaust was divine punishment for violating the three oaths. It was God's punishment upon European Jewry for Zionism. That's his opinion, because violating the three oaths is no joke, according to the rabbi. According to the Quran, when the Sahaba suffered a calamity in Musiba at Uhud, some of them said, Anna hadha. 
How could this be? Where is this coming from? What is the answer? قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ This is from your own selves. This is Allah's response. That is to say, because of your disobedience. These were Sahaba, the best generation. They're much better people than us. خَيْرُ nas qarni. Now, don't get the wrong idea. Obviously, this does not absolve or exonerate the mushrikeen for what they were doing to the Muslims. No, they were wrongdoers and oppressors and persecutors. There's no doubt. This is without question. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, reproaches the Muslims for their disobedience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets a high bar for us. A kafir will act like a kafir. But a Muslim is held at a higher level. And then the ayah ends by saying, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Imam Suyuti said, Surely God has power over everything, including the, the giving of assistance and the withholding of it. And he punished you for disobeying the direct command of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And notice there were Sahaba who were killed by the mushrikeen, okay, who did not obey, who did not disobey the Prophet sallallahu The actions of a few can affect many. So this is not some repackaged original sin doctrine. No. I'm referring to the consequences of sin. And you know what's interesting? We find commensurate ideas in traditional Jewish theology. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the believers throughout history. فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ tabdila, And you will not find a change in the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most famous anti-Zionist rabbis was named Rabbi Israel Meir Kagan. Uh, he was a great halakist, a jurist. He died in 1933. This is what he said. Quote, the Zionists are the dead limbs of our people which caused the entire body to rot. You get that? The Zionists are the dead limbs of our people which caused the entire body to rot. In other words, the Zionists are making trouble for all of us. Their fitna is affecting all of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that he warned Bani Israel not to cause corruption, fasad in the earth. And then when they did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, Ba'athna alaykum ibadan lana uli ba'sin shadid. We sent against you our slaves of great might, the Babylonians. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Babylonians his slaves. Ultimately, everyone and everything is a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, willingly or unwillingly. There are good slaves and bad slaves. There are obedient slaves and disobedient slaves. There is nothing in the heavens and the earth except that it approaches Allah as a servant, a slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished Bani Israel. The Bani Israel was the Muslim ummah at that time. The Babylonians, a kingdom of pagans, of mushrikeen, destroyed the temple. They killed countless believers and took thousands back to Babylon to be slaves. They were in captivity for 70 years. Why? Ma'asiyah, fasad, disobedience, corruption. In the Tanakh, Jeremiah tried to warn the Jewish leaders about this, but they did not he uh, heed him. Here's something interesting. Genesis 17.20. Genesis 17.20 in the Torah, the apparent speaker is God. This is what God says to Abraham. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. Okay? So the very famous Spanish rabbi and Torah commentator named Bahia ben Asher, okay, Jewish commentator, uh, this is what he says in, the, in his commentary. Once this prophecy came true, Islam conquered the civilized world like a whirlwind. We, the Jewish people, lost our position of preeminence in the world due to our sins, end quote. In other words, Islam dominates in the world now at his time because we, the Jews, he's saying, or sinful. And here's a picture of Rabbi Yol Teitelbaum, founder of the highly anti-Zionist Satmar Hasidic dynasty. <coughs> and he died in 1979. The traditional Orthodox, uh, they also cite a passage in the Torah to demonstrate the importance of upholding the three oaths in our time. So in the book of Numbers, the fifth book of the Torah, okay, we're told that some of the Israelites under Moses, they wanted to leave the wilderness prematurely and without God's permission. 
and enter the Holy Land. So God decreed 40 years of wandering, of exile, and some of the people of Moses wanted to end that exile immediately and march into the Holy Land. Okay, you understand? Some wanted to end the exile immediately and march into the Holy Land. Okay? So these people said, this is according to Numbers chapter 14, verses 40 to 42. The Hebrew says, Hineinu va'aleinu el hamakom asher amar Adonai. Here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. In other words, we're not going to wait any longer. We're going now. This is taking too long. We're going now. Vayomer Moshe, and Moses said, Lamma ze atem ovrim fpi Adonai. Why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will never, ever succeed. Leaving exile early and entering the land and establishing the land without God's permission will never, ever succeed. And then he says, Do not go up. Do not make aliyah. Literally. Ki ein Adonai bikir kavim. Bikir uh, bakim. Do not go up, because the Lord is not with you. And so anti-Zionist rabbis to this day continue to tell Zionist Jews that this blasphemous project of theirs called modern Israel will never succeed, because the Lord is not with you. In our terms, there's no tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember what Rabbi Jushinsky, uh, his predecessor, Rabbi Sonnenfeld said, that so Dr. Herzl comes not from the Lord, but from the side of pollution. Here's another verse. This is the final sermon of Moses to the children of Israel. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. This is in their book. They will do evil in the latter days. So it's very important to draw a distinction between traditional Judaism and Zionist Judaism. Okay? The latter I also refer to as radical Judaism. So Zionist Judaism is radical Judaism. There are many Jews today who describe themselves as Orthodox. Okay? If they are Zionist, they are radical. They are interchangeable. A Zionist is a radical. Now, what does the term radical mean in the context of religion? Essentially, something that is, rad something that is radical in a religious context constitutes a drastic and highly significant departure from the normative tradition by normative, I mean what the scriptures clearly say in their most apparent meaning. And by tradition, I mean something that is widely known and long-standing. Okay? In recent years in the academy, we've seen the rise, the rapid rise, of something called radical hermeneutics. So these are interpretations of the Bible and Quran that fly into the face of centuries-long established theological and moral orthodoxy. Interpretations of sacred text that arrogantly dismiss the work of thousands of scholars over hundreds and hundreds of years, scholars who were grounded in the foundational principles of the respective faith traditions. And not only are these radical hermeneutes dismissive of traditional scholarship, but they're also dismissive and uh, insulting of the scholars themselves, whom they often vilify an insult. But long before the social constructionists and gender theorists and militant uh, feminists got their hands on the Quran and Bible, in this case the Bible, the Zionists got there first. Today, there are also hundreds of thousands of traditional Orthodox Jews who vehemently oppose Zionism on both theological and moral grounds, so they accuse Zionists of hijacking Judaism. Their motto is Yahudi Lotzioni, a Jew is not a Zionist. And so they actually anathematize Zionist Jews. They make took fear of them. They believe that there's a fundamental incompatibility between Judaism and Zionism. Rather than the modern state of Israel being a Jewish state, they call it, uh, sorry, being uh, 
a Jewish nation, they call it an abomination. One such organization is called Natura Carta International. Their leaders are aligned with the Muslim community on the issue of Palestine. They even attend major Muslim conventions and events. Uh, there is also Satmar, there is Shomer Emunim. <clears throat> Do we agree with everything that anti-Zionist Jews say? No, of course not. They're Jews and we're Muslims. We have differences and those differences matter. But you can look up some of these uh, courageous rabbis because they are truly courageous. Rabbi Dovid Weiss, Rabbi Elhanan Beck, Rabbi Aviad Niger, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, Rabbi uh, David uh, Mivaser. Tolesu sawa amin ahlil kitab. It's very important. They are not all the same. We don't lump everyone in the same category because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he doesn't do that in the Quran. Okay? Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, you will find the most severe among mankind in enmity towards the believers, i.e. the Muslims, to be Jews and the idolaters. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Musa ummatun wa bihi And of the people of Moses is a community that guides by truth and acts with justice. This is why with, the, with this issue of Ahlil Kitab, the Quran requires tadabbur, a deeply reflective and penetrating intellectual engagement. Right? Ibn Hisham, he said, the Qur'an is like a jumla wahida. It's like a single statement. We have to look at the Qur'an holistically and be very careful about blanket statements. The Qur'an is nuanced, we must be nuanced. The Qur'an is wise, we must be wise. <clears throat> okay. So, just a, a quick review here, and then we can maybe have a short a break with a Q&A session, and then take a longer break later. This is what happened essentially. Essentially, Zionist ideas were adopted and appropriated by many Ashkenazic Orthodox Jewish leaders starting in the early 20th century, and these ideas continued to grow in popularity among their segment after World War II. These Zionist ideas <clears throat> were dangled in front of their noses until they finally succumbed to them. They did not have the istiqama that was required of them by their own long-standing tradition to resist the temptation. And so, Zionism became something of a radical reform movement within Jewish Orthodoxy, among the Ashkenazim, European Jewry. According to non-Zionist traditional Jews, known as the Haredim or the Haredi, both secular Zionists and religious Zionists stake highly radical positions. They violate long-standing established principles of Judaism. The consequences of which, by the way, are identical, the ethnic cleansing and genocide of Palestinians. And we'll see that. <clears throat> the secular Zionists violated centuries-long understandings of what it meant to be a Jew what is a Jew? For secular Zionists, the essence of Jewishness is to be of the Jewish race. That's it. Religion is not central, is not essential. The Torah is not essential. God is not essential. If you have Jewish blood from your mother's side, even if you are an atheist, come make Aliyah to Israel and contribute to the displacement of Palestinians. Come move into this kibbutz in the West Bank and terrorize the indigenous Palestinians. So, those are the secular Zionists. Okay, what is the radical position of the religious Zionists? People like Rabbi Abraham Isaac Kook and his Merkaz Harav and his son Yehuda Kook. What a bunch of kooks, right? <laughs> For these religious Zionists, the Zionist movement constitutes what's known as Hadchalat Ga'ula, the beginning of the redemption. That is to say, Zionism is a means by which God will bring about the Jewish redemption under the Messiah. This is the great blasphemy. Therefore, for the religious Jewish Zionists, a Jew may no longer remain diasporic. He can now reject this idea of a divinely decreed indefinite exile. What's the result of that? Come make Aliyah to Israel and contribute to the displacement of the Palestinians. Come move into this kibbutz in the West Bank and terrorize the indigenous Palestinians. Same result. 
But it gets even worse. Again, according to radical Jewish Zionists, God promised the Holy Land to the sons of Jacob. And so it is the duty of his descendants to seize the Holy Land and to implement the various mitzvot or commandments in the Torah that are particular to the Holy Land. And then eventually, the Messiah will come and rule from Jerusalem, the Davidic King Messiah. What mitzvot am I talking about? What commandments am I talking about? The mitzvah to commit cherem, from the river to the sea. What is cherem? Genocide and ethnic cleansing. I'll come back to this idea, very, very important. The mitzvah to exterminate Amalek, whom both Benzi Lieberman and Benjamin Netanyahu explicitly identified as the Palestinians. Wholesale genocide of men, women, children, and animals. These are the radical Jews. I'll come back to this later, inshallah. This is very, very important. So here you have <clears throat> anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews <clears throat> at a protest. You see them with the Palestinian flag. Judaism rejects Zionism. Yehudi lo tzioni. A Jew is not a Zionist. And here you have anti-Zionist rabbis. Um, on the left there, you have Rabbi Dovid Weiss of Natura Carta International, quite outspoken. Uh, on the top right, that's Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. He's a Satmar uh, rabbi, Hasidic rabbi, student of Teitelbaum. And below him, Elchanan Beck, who's also from Natura Carta International. Okay. A brief history. <clears throat> so at this point, I want to give you some very brief, uh, by the way, any questions at this point? Yes. Yeah. Uh, So at what point uh, the Zionist movement, at, as we mentioned, that uh, from the um, non-religious Zionist and religious Zionist, their aim got merged with the evangelist Christians. That's very good question. I'm coming to that. It's a big okay. topic. Christian Zionism, big topic. The vast, vast, vast majority of Zionists are not Jewish. They're Christian. And my contention is, just like I'm making for Judaism, if Christians would follow their tradition, even though I don't believe in their tradition, I think their tradition is wrong, because I'm Muslim, right? But if they would follow their tradition, they would not be Zionists. And they would not give billions of dollars a year, every year, to this state of Israel. But we'll come to this, inshallah. Very important point. Yes. The irony that you're probably going to go to go to with the Dajjal is that they're thinking they're bringing the Messiah, and they're yeah. actually bringing the Dajjal. That was yeah. what I, I know. That's something that you're probably going to right. Will, yeah. But so, oh, okay. So, but my question was the the Ashkenazi Jew, and I believe the, the other one would be the Sephardic. So I don't understand how. Ashkenazi Jews are considered real Jews when it was it was like a mass conversion. How was that accepted? I know it was like a, a king or a leader, but can you just briefly talk about how that's now, if you trace your lineage as an Ashkenazi Jew, like, you know what I mean? How did that become that you're actually a bona fide Jew? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, it's a controversial issue. Um, some consider this to be anti-Semitic. Uh, but there's something, there's some basis for it in, in ancient Jewish writings, actually, the Sefer Chuzari by Judah Halevi, that the kingdom of Chazaria, which is a kingdom that was sort of between the Black and Caspian Seas in the 7th century, 6th century, somewhere, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, later than that, 8th century, that the entire kingdom en masse converted to Judaism. So they're not actually descendants. Uh, they're not actually Semites, right? Uh, so so that's, that's interesting, right? So uh, Theodor Herzl, who is an Ashkenazi Jew, if he cannot trace his lineage, you know, back to Abraham, and he doesn't believe in God, then how is he Jewish? It's a, it's a very interesting question, you know. Some would say, no, it's, uh, that's anti-Semitic. Uh, obviously, the Ashkenazim, at some point, they're descendants of, of Abraham, but 
I think that remains to be proven. Yeah. But one can certainly convert to Judaism, right? You can convert to Judaism and you can make Aliyah to Israel. But if you're an atheist and you're an Ashkenazi, then what's really tying you to Judaism? That's, that's the question. Yes. Um, so I have one more question as well. So um, could you please uh, define for us, regular people, anti-Semitic term itself? The, the term, the language that we know of, the, which are Semitic language, is um, Hebrew, Aramaic, and um, in Arabic, right? Yes. But then, what? How do you be able to define that anti-Semitic? If, if, if feel like you know, right now, the definition of this term seems to be changing so much so that it encapsulate, encapsulate how are you going to say something mm -hmm. and it's just getting broader day by day. Yeah. So this is a very good question. Okay, this is one of the FAQs I was going to tackle at the end of the presentation, but we'll take it now. So a question that you might get if you are critical of Israel is, are you anti-Semitic? Right? So here I would ask a question, ask the person who's saying this, where does the word Semitic come from? What is the etiology? What is the etymology of the word Semite? And they'll have 99% of the time they have no idea what, you're, what the answer is. So Semite comes from Sam or Shem, the son of Noah. Okay, so who are the Semites? Well, Jews and Arabs. That's number one. Okay, so Israelites and Ishmaelites are Semites. Now as Muslims, we believe in prophets, right? And there's a group of prophets called the Ulul Azam min al-Rusul, right? These are the five most exalted human beings. Four out of five of them are Semites. And these are the most beloved human beings to Muslims. So how can I be an anti-Semite? So what they really mean is, are you anti-Jewish? Okay. So but here we need to clarify. How are you using the word Jewish? As an ethnicity or religion? If as an ethnicity, no, that's stupid. Hating people for something they had no control over is stupid. And I am not stupid. Okay, they'll say, are you anti-Judaism? So here again, we need to clarify. <laughs> am I anti-traditional Orthodox Judaism? No, traditional Jewish Orthodoxy is a respectable religion that believes and reveres the God of Abraham and enjoins uh, people to righteousness. Am I anti-radical Judaism? Yes. Why? Because radical Judaism has incorporated Zionism. And Zionism is a violent and murderous ideology, as well as blasphemy, from both traditional Jewish and Christian perspectives, and we'll see that. So at this point, they might say, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. So you should respond, so all of these hundreds of thousands of anti-Zionist Jews, are they all self-hating Jews? Why do they hate themselves? That's it. Just let them answer this question. Okay? okay. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. There are thousands and thousands of Jews that are anti-Zionist. Why do they hate themselves? That's it. Are you saying that these are not real Jews? That seems a little anti-Semitic, don't you? Don't you think so? So we need to, we need to clarify. What do you mean? Don't, get, don't let people get away with ambiguities. Let them clarify. OK, let's continue then. We'll take more questions later, inshallah. They're very good questions. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, obviously, I'm going to leave out, leave out a lot of the historical, historical uh, events, um, but it's important for us to get a little bit into it. I'm certainly no expert in the history of Palestine or the history of the politics of Palestine, but I'll do my best, inshallah ta'ala, with our limitations. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his barakah and tawfiq. So let's start in 1917. In 1917, the British Empire, uh, under General uh, Edmund Allenby, a staunch British uh, Zionist, conquered Palestine from the Ottomans and promised to give it to the Jews to be their homeland. This is called the Balfour Declaration. Most people have heard of this. 
They wanted to create a, quote, national home for the Jewish people, to quote it exactly. Um, Arthur Balfour was the foreign uh, secretary under Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Balfour, by the way, was highly anti-Jewish. And this is news for a lot of people. Balfour did not want Jews to live in England. In fact, many British Jews outright denounced his declaration, declaration because they saw it as a means of ethnically cleansing the Jews living in Britain. The British did what they did for strategic and imperialistic reasons. So they already controlled the Suez Canal, but they also wanted to control the shortest uh, land route to India, which was from Haifa to Basra. Haifa in Palestine to Basra in Iraq. The shortest route from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf. And here they built roads, they built an oil pipeline, and air bases. And so Zionism was a useful tool for Britain to carry out its imperialistic aspirations. Nonetheless, Jews from all over Europe began pouring into Palestine, British Mandate Palestine, which obviously caused tensions between the indigenous Arabs and Jews and the newly arrived European Jews. Of course, the vast majority of the population were Arabs and the land was called Palestine. In the 1920s and 30s, various Jewish militia groups sprang up in Palestine. Groups like Haganah and Irgun. These groups were terrorist groups. Even the New York Post and even Winston Churchill called them terrorists. Churchill himself, in my opinion, was a terrorist. I mean, how many hundreds of thousands, millions of innocent civilians did he carpet bomb in, in, in Hamburg and in Dresden? Absolutely disgraceful. Now, these groups, Haganah and Irgun, would commit political violence, atrocities, murder, massacre, and absolutely terrorize the Palestinians. And at some point in the late 30s, British interest in establishing a Jewish state began to wane. It was no longer in their strategic interest. It was the eve of World War II. The British assumed that they would be fighting in the so-called Middle East, and so they did not want to further agitate the Arabs. And so the British began to restrict Jewish immigration into Palestine. This was after the Arab Revolt in 1936 to 39. The British articulated this in the famous White Paper presented to Parliament in 1939. So the White Paper said that in 10 years, an independent Palestinian state would be established with an Arab majority and the future and that future Jewish immigration had to be according to Palestinian consent. Irgun did not like that. Not one bit. So what did they do? They blew up the King David Hotel in 1946. That was the headquarters of the British. They killed Muslim, Jew, Christian, men, women, children, 91 killed, about 50 injured, a terrorist attack. Here's some interesting facts. Menachem Begin, the former Prime Minister of Israel was a former head of the Irgun. <laughs> and Ariel Sharon, another former Prime Minister, was once a member of the Haganah. And the Haganah, after 1948, became the IDF, Israeli Defense Force. So think about that. That's like the KKK becoming the American police and military. Many of them did, by the way. Did you know this? August 8th, 1925, 30,000 hooded Klansmen marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. 30,000. 1925. Those were just the men in D.C. Imagine the total membership in the entire country. These people didn't just dissolve into thin air. Another interesting fact, very little known fact, here's a coin. You see that? That was struck in 1934 in Germany. A star of David on one side and a swastika on the other. The Zionists and Nazis were actually working together in Germany. <clears throat> During the beginning of the Third Reich, Hitler is the Chancellor of Germany in 1934. Why? They shared a common goal. They both wanted Jews to leave Europe. In this case, Germany. The Nazis were Zionists. You know, like how we say today, Zionism and Nazism are two sides of the same coin. Literally, two <laughs> sides of the same coin. <laughs> Ajib. In October 1953, the IDF, led by Ariel Sharon, attacked the village of Qibya in the West Bank and massacred 69 civilians, mostly women and children. The attack was condemned by the U.S. State Department and the U.N. Security Council. Now, backing up a little bit, 
June 1919, Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations. This declared that the Arab areas that had been part of the Ottoman Empire and were now made mandates under European powers, these would eventually be made into independent nations and receive self-determination. So this happened to every other Arab state under European <coughs> mandate except Palestine. This happened to Iraq, to Syria, to Lebanon, Allah to Jordan. Akbar, the Palestinians never received self-determination. As Dr. Rashid Khalidi said, the Palestinians Akbar, were denied what under Article 22 was allowed to every other Arab state under Allah European Akbar. mandate. So settler colonialism is a type of conquest. Okay, okay, and I highly recommend Dr. Rashid Khalidi's book. It's called The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. It's a new book, a uh, history of um, settler col uh, colonial conquest and resistance, 1917 to, to 2017. So inherent within European settler colonialism is the dispossession of the indigenous population, either through genocide, like in America or Canada, or ethnic cleansing, that is to say forced expulsion. Here's a quote from Khalidi. Ethnic cleansing is inherent in Zionism, inherent. Herzl was no exception to this. He wanted to drive away the Arabs. Herzl was European to his core. The Balfour Declaration never even mentioned the Palestinians because that's the point. They are not a people, according to the Zionists. A land without a people, they say. Completely false history. When we look back at the Islamic conquest, we see something very different. The indigenous were allowed to live in their homes and practice their religions and customs. The Zoroastrians survived in Iran. The Christians survive in North Africa to this day. There are millions of them. If they convert, they convert. If not, they pay a tribute tax if they can afford it, and they are guaranteed protection from the Muslim polity. Genocide and ethnic cleansing are against the principles of Islamic conquest. We have this concept of Ahlid Kitab. In 1947, the British just kind of threw their hands up and left Palestine. They left Palestine to the United Nations. It's a UN problem now. So the UN partitioned Palestine. Now in 1947, the Jews constituted about one third of the population. Most of them, the vast majority, newly arrived. Yet they were offer, offered 60, uh, sorry, 56% of Palestine. The Arabs, who were the majority and had lived there for generations, were offered 44%. Neither group found this favorable. So even though the Zionists, uh, Israelis, um, publicly agreed with the partition plan, they did not want an Arab majority within greater Israel. They wanted a Jewish ethnostate. An Arab majority totally contradicts this. So here's Balfour on the right, and here's the partition. Now David Ben-Gurion was quoted as saying, David Ben-Gurion, the first ever Prime Minister of Israel, quote, after the formation of a large army in the wake of the establishment of the state, we will abolish partition and expand to the whole of Palestine, end quote. So Israel's agreement was largely tactical. They always had it in their minds to expand and take the whole of historical Palestine from the river to the sea. Now, starting in March 1948, these Israeli militia groups, these terrorist factions, they put something into effect called Plan Dalet. And I highly recommend reading about this in a book by Elon Pape. So there's a book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine by Elon Pape. What did Plan Dalet do? It displaced 750,000 Palestinians. It forced them to leave Palestine or forced them into Gaza, which of course became a huge open air concentration camp. Giora Island, right? So Giora Island, E-I-L-A-N-D, is a retired major general of the IDF. Island is also a former head of the Israeli National Security Council. In 2004, he called Gaza a concentration camp. So here we have a top security official in the Israeli government refer to Gaza as a concentration camp. And this was before the blockade. David Cameron, the former Prime Minister of UK, he called Gaza an open-air prison. Prison doesn't really cut it. People in prison are usually treated like human beings. According to Finkelstein, in 2003, 
The respected professor at Hebrew University, Baruch Kimmerling, described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever. Now, in 2023, according to Finkelstein, Gaza is, quote, a death camp. So in Plan Dalet in 1948, 500 villages were destroyed, and there were many reports of multiple massacres, dozens upon dozens, indiscriminate killing of men, women, and children. Uh, for example, at Deir Yassin, at Haifa, at Jaffa, uh, Israel declared itself a state on May 14, 1948. This is called the Nakba. And then the UN formally recognized Israel on May 11, 1949. And the Palestinian territories until this day continue to be under occupation and continue to shrink. The Palestinians continue to live as second-class citizens in their own country. And second-class is a big understatement. So in the occupied territories, Gaza, East Jerusalem, West Bank, it is nothing short of apartheid. And this is according to Bet Salem, an Israeli human rights organization, Amnesty International. Palestinians have no rights in the occupied territories. They're treated like animals. They're called animals. Just a few weeks ago, the IDF were passing out assault rifles to Israeli settlers in the West Bank like it was candy. Now, something happened in 1954 that I think we should be aware of. We should not forget these moments in history. This is something that's thrown down the rabbit hole of history. It's called the Lavan Affair, named after the former uh, Israeli defense minister, Finhas Lavan. What is the Lavan Affair? So this was an attempted false flag operation, codenamed Operation Susanna, carried out by Israeli spies in Egypt in 1954. So these Zionist Israeli agents in Egypt planted bombs in busy civilian areas in Cairo and Alexandria, where Americans and the British would often visit, like movie theaters and libraries. The plan was to commit terrorism by killing civilians, especially Americans, and then blame Egyptian Muslims in order to cause tensions between Egypt and the West. The plan fell apart, and the Zionist spies were caught and then confessed the Lavan affair. Very interesting. Moving ahead to the 1967 war, so Israel, through, quote, a preemptive strike, took control of the West Bank, Gaza, the old city of Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. They gave back part of the Golan Heights and the Sinai, but continued to occupy Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. According to international law, it is illegal to acquire pro uh, a territory by war. So the UN passed Resolution 242 in 1967, calling for Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories immediately. That was 56 years ago. Israel has yet to comply. <clears throat> ah. In the midst of the war, on June 8, 1967, Israel attacked the USS Liberty, an unarmed American naval ship in international waters flying the American flag. It was a coordinated attack from the air and sea. The Liberty was identified by Israeli pilots as being American. There is no doubt about this. This was not mistaken identity. There are recordings. Despite clearly identifying the ship as American by reading out the ship's whole number and seeing the American flag, Israeli pilots fired at the ship from, abo from above, and Israeli missile boats fired torpedoes from below. 34 American sailors were killed, another 174 injured. That's more than two-thirds of the total number of sailors on the ship. The American government tried to cover this up. They tried to hide this event from the press and the American public. To this day, survivors and relatives um, meet once a year to read the names of the deceased and try to understand why their greatest ally in the Middle East intentionally and callously attacked them. The most likely reason was is that the U.S. S. Liberty was a spy ship, and as a spy ship, it was listening in on Israel's war plans. Israel didn't like that, so they tried to massacre everyone on the ship. Okay, continuing then. So we're looking at the brief history. So we talked about the USS Liberty attack on June 8th, 1967. So, let's see here. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Israel continued to build settlements and occupy territories. In September 1982, uh, Defense Minister Ariel Sharon ordered the massacre of about 3,000 Palestinian refugees and Lebanese civilians at the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila in Beirut, uh, Lebanon. 
Uh, there was torture, mutilation, and rape over three days. The UN called this, quote, an act of genocide. The Israeli military, along with their ally, an extreme right-wing Christian militia group called the Falange, were held responsible. Uh, Sharon resigned, but then became prime minister nine years later. Strange how that happens. Uh, in 1993, the famous Oslo Accords were held. Now here, a Zionist apologists will say, oh, Palestinians were offered a state in 1993 during the Oslo Accords, and yet they rejected it, right? So the Oslo Accords was uh, a, a sham, um, and I'll tell you why. The, the stated goal of the Oslo Accords uh, was to create an autonomous Palestinian state where Palestinians had self-determination. Uh, this was a sham. According to the Oslo Accords, the occupied West Bank would be turned into three areas. Okay, so you had Area A or Zone A, Zone B, and Zone C. So Area A would be given to the Palestinians. The Palestinians would have civil and security control over Area A. Area A was 18% of the West Bank. Area B would be 22% uh, of the West Bank. In Area B, the Palestinians would have civil control, but Israel would control uh, the security. Um, in both areas, A and B, Israel could still conduct their raids whenever they wanted. So even in Area A, where the Palestinians were in so-called full control, this control could be overridden whenever Israel wanted. Area C was 60% of the West Bank. Area C was under full Israeli control. So in reality, all three areas would be under Israeli control. Uh, this was the so-called autonomous Palestinian state. This was where the Palestinians were, were, were supposed to have so-called self-determination. No, it was a, sh a sham. It was an on-job horse and pony show. Um, what about the Palestinian refugees? Did they have the right to return? What about East Jerusalem? Nothing. In the 30 years since the Oslo meetings, the number of Israeli settlers in the West Bank has gone from 100,000 to half a million. On November 8th, 1995, the Israeli Prime Minister, who signed the Oslo Accords, at least the first sort of round of the Accords, Yitzhak Rabin, was assassinated by an Israeli terrorist and Jewish radical named Yigal Amir. Now, Amir uh, justified his action religiously. He appealed to something called the Din Rodef, the Law of the Pursuer. So this is a law mentioned in Sanhedrin 73a in the Talmud. But it's based upon the Torah, Leviticus 19.16. It says, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. In other words, if you see a person pursuing to kill another person, you're responsible to put yourself in harm's way and prevent the pursuer from committing murder. And if necessary, you may have to kill the pursuer, the rodef. You must intervene to save a life, even if it means taking a life. You cannot stand idly by. So the rabbis, they mention uh, Moses, peace be upon him. He intervened when the Egyptian taskmaster was beating the Hebrew slave. Moses intervened and ended up killing the Egyptian. But that was okay because the Rodef, the Egyptian, would have killed the slave. So in Amir's mind, Yitzhak Rabin was endangering Jewish lives by recognizing a so-called Palestinian state. And so his defense in court was that Rabin was a Rodef. Right? His defense was uh, rejected. Interestingly, Zionist Orthodox Jewish professor Jeffrey Alderman argued that since the Gazans voted Hamas in, every Gazan is a Rodef and must be killed. Same logic, apparently, as bin Laden. Every American is fair game. The difference is 70% of Gazans are either refugees or, children's of refu or children of refugees who held an election while living inside the world's largest concentration camp and 50% of Gazans are children who never voted for anyone. According to the Zionist uh, Orthodox Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, all Palestinian children are rodfim, he says, because when they get older, they're just all gonna be terrorists anyway, so Israel might as well kill them now. That's his logic. This guy's on the internet, he's on YouTube. Then you have this absolute psychopath, Rabbi Manus Friedman, who says very similar things. He has over 400,000 followers on his channel. The Camp David summit in 2000, you have Bill Clinton, Ehud Barak, Yasser Arafat, again, a sham horse and pony show. No Palestinian autonomy, no Palestinian self-determination. Hillary Clinton is, of course, making her rounds now, right, going on The View. The Palestinians were offered a state in 1947, 1993, and 2000. The Palestinians are constantly rejecting a two-state solution. So this is a major Zionist talking point. According to Norman Finkelstein, 
an expert in Gaza, Palestinian history. Every year for decades, the UN votes on a General Assembly resolution. That resolution is called the Peaceful Settlement of the Question of Palestine. This happens every single year. The Peaceful Settlement on the, of the Question of Palestine. The rev uh, this resolution would give the Palestinians a state on the June 1967 borders, and the agreement would be based upon international law. Every year, the whole world votes in favor, including Palestine, and only America and Israel and a few island, small island nations vote against it. Israel does not want a two-state solution. On February 25th, 1994, an Israeli terrorist and Jewish radical named Baruch Goldstein massacred 29 Palestinians who were worshiping at Masjid Ibrahim salam in Hebron and Al Khalil in the occupied West Bank. This happened at Salat al Fajr at Ramad in Ramadan. 29 adults and children were murdered and another 130 injured. This is called the Cave of the Patriarchs Massacre. Goldstein was born in Brooklyn and moved to Israel in 1983 after becoming radicalized. He was a member of a radical Jewish movement called the Kach Party, founded in 1971 by Rabbi Meir Kahana. The, this party was banned uh, in Israel in 1994 and declared a terrorist organization. Goldstein was a student of Kahana. Kahana wrote a book called They Must Go. He also coined the phrase, never again. So Kahana exploited the Holocaust as an excuse to advocate for another Holocaust, essentially. Kahana was as, uh, assassinated in 1990. Now, the majority of Israelis today condemn Goldstein for being the terrorist that he was. But a minority of Jewish radicals praise him. They continue to make annual pilgrimages to his gravesite to this day. Right, someone who killed prostrating children. The eulogy on his tomb reads, the revered Dr. Barach Kapel Goldstein, son of Israel. He gave his soul for the sake of the people of Israel, the Torah and the land. His hands are clean and his heart good. So essentially Goldstein was a suicide bomber, but with an automatic weapon. I mean, he knew they would kill him on the spot. Disturbingly, Goldstein's ideology has recently made a major comeback. So Kahanism is gaining popularity right now in so-called Israel. There is a far-right party in Israel called the Otsma Yehudit. It literally means Jewish power. In 2022, the leader of this party, Itamar ben Gavir, who is literally a convicted terrorist, became Minister of National Security under Netanyahu. He is a devoted Kahanist. Ben Gavir used, uh, used to have a picture of, of Baruch Goldstein hanging in his living room. <laughs> this is confirmed. Goldstein is his hero. So Goldstein ideo Goldstein's ideology is now the mainstream of the Israeli government. So these people want to incite a religious war, a religious holocaust of Arabs in Palestine. So how do these Kahanists justify these actions religiously or scripturally? So it's one thing to say that Jews can end the exile and return to the Holy Land. It's another thing to say that they can kill with impunity the Arabs that live there. I'll come back to this uh, inshallah. So here he is, Baruch Goldstein, the terrorist. This is his grave on the right, frequently visited. Here's Mir Kahana, his teacher, founder of the Kach Party, the Kahanist Party, teacher of Goldstein, author of They Must Go, coined the phrase never again. And of course, here is Ben Gavir, the current minister of national security under Netanyahu and devoted Kahanist. Of course, right behind him, you see Otsma Yehudit, Jewish power. Okay, maybe take one or two questions at this point before we move to Christian Zionism. Um, I had a quick question about like the significance of the Solomon Temple and their obsession with like the Uts. Oh. The, the temple, yes, I'll get to that inshallah. So the, the short answer is that based on their interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, there are indications that the temple will be rebuilt uh, a third time. Um, so, and the one who will rebuild it will be the Messiah. Right, so this is something that they're anticipating greatly. But I'll get to this in general. Okay, 
let's just take one online viewer and uh, we'll get yeah. the question from online is, are there any Quranic prophecies about the Jewish state of Israel? Quranic prophecies about the Jewish state of Israel? Uh, nothing, no, nothing comes to mind. I mean, maybe someone can sort of derive a meaning from an ayah uh, that might indicate something like that, but there's nothing clear as far as I know. Allahu alam. So these Jews that oppose the state of Israel, these Orthodox Jews who are still active today, um, if they think that Israel should never have existed, what is their proposed solution now? Their proposed solution is to dissolve the state of Israel uh, and go back to how it was uh, before Zionism, where basically it's Palestinian land, and in Palestine you had uh, Muslims, Jews, and Christians living together uh, in peace, in prosperity. The problem for them is this nationalistic, secular state of Israel that has made a mess of things, right? That has caused nothing but war and destruction and animosity. And now people think that it's just common knowledge now, unfortunately. People just think Arabs and Jews have always hated each other because of these, because of modern politics. It's just not the case whatsoever. Again, read history. Look at Christian Europe. The Jews had a horrible time living in Christian Europe. And they would flee to Muslim countries. So this is their proposed, their proposed solution. The state of Israel must be dissolved. It is, there is no tofiq in it. This will never succeed, as the Torah says. Book of Numbers, chapter 14. We have more questions, but do you want to continue? Or let's, to let's continue. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to do. We'll get more to the questions, inshallah. Now, at this point, I want to turn to the topic of Christian Zionism. Okay, So these two words, Christian, Zionist, they should never be in apposition. It's an oxymoron. It's jumbo shrimp. It's four-sided triangle. The whole concept of Christian Zionism is absolutely just mind-boggling to me. I'll tell you why it boggles the mind. Now, first of all, we know that Theodore Herzl himself met with Pope Pius X in 1904 and asked for the Pope's support for Zionism, and the Pope said absolutely not. And that was in 1904. So part and parcel to the Zionist project that the sister was asking about from a Jewish religious standpoint is the construction of the third temple on the so-called Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Okay, Of course, the first temple was built by Solomon, to the man alayhi salam, around 1000 BCE. It was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE under Nebuchadnezzar. The second temple was built around 515 BCE, and it was destroyed uh, in 70 of the Common Era by the Romans under uh, General Titus. Now, Jewish Zionists want to build the Third Temple. Now, it is clearly, unambiguously, unequivocally against the teachings of the New Testament for a Christian to support the construction of a Third Temple in Jerusalem. For a Christian to do this is to commit clear-cut blasphemy according to the New Testament. Okay. And yet there are millions upon millions of Christian Zionists all around the world. They donate millions of dollars to the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. In fact, the vast majority of Zionists are not Jewish. They're Christian, mostly Protestant. It's just a fact. There's only 15 million, world, there's only 15 million Jews worldwide. One of the largest and most influential Christian Zionist organizations in the world is called KUFI, C-U-F-I, Christians United for Israel, led by a loudmouth preacher from Texas named John Hagee. Why is it blasphemy? Why is Kufi Kufr? Before I get to that, here's an interesting piece of trivia. Up until a few years ago, the executive director of Kufi was David Brog, the cousin of former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. So the executive director of Christians United for Israel was Jewish, the cousin of the Israeli Prime Minister. You can't make this stuff up. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus himself is the new temple, okay? And the Gospel of John begins with something called the prologue, the hymn to the Logos. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It continues, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And here's the Greek, kai halagos, sarks agenata, kai eskenosin en homin. And the Word became flesh, and eskenosin, this verb, comes from the, the noun skene, which means a tent or a canopy. You see, in the Old Testament, the presence of God, it's called the kavod in Hebrew, or shekhinah, the presence of God, was said to have dwelled in the tent of meeting. This is called the mishkan in Hebrew, the tabernacle in the wilderness. 
Okay, at the time of Moses and Joshua, this indwelling was figurative. It wasn't literal. This tent was the prototype of the first temple that would be built by Solomon 400 years later. So the temple honorifically is called Beth-El, Beit-Ollah, the house of God. Again, in this you know, figurative sense, the temple housed God's spirit, as it were, in this figurative sense. But what did John say in the prologue? And the word became flesh and tented himself among us. In other words, Jesus is the new Mishkan that houses the kavod, the presence of God. In the very next chapter, John chapter 2, we, we read that the Jews said to Jesus, what sign can you give us? And Jesus said, again, this is the Johannine Jesus, the New Testament Jesus. This is not Isa al okay? This is the Jesus of Christian scripture. He said, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. And the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days? And then John, the author, says, ah, but he spoke the temple of his body. Okay, the, the Hebrew word for temple, heikal, also means body. The New Testament Jesus is saying that he is the new temple. For Christians to support the construction of a third temple in, Jeru into, in Jerusalem is to deny the New Testament Jesus. Jesus replaces the temple, according to the New Testament. Jesus never uttered, the New Testament Jesus, never uttered a single word about a third temple. But time and again, he emphatically predicts the destruction of the second temple. So now we have Christian, so now we have Zionist Jews rebelling against God's decree of exile, and we have Zionist Christians rebelling against Jesus' pronouncement that he is the new temple. So I call this double kufr theology. Okay? For Jews to end the exile and bre break the three oaths is kufr, according to traditional Judaism. That's one kufr. For Christians to support the construction of the third temple, when Jesus is a new temple, is kufr, according to traditional Christianity. That's the second kufr, double kufr theology. The modern Israelis, they place the sign near the Temple Mount that says, the divine presence, the Shekhinah, never moves from the Western Wall. I don't know if anyone has ever gone. I'll never go because I'm an Iranian citizen. They'll never let me in. One of my professors in grad school was a Franciscan friar, and a Catholic priest, white guy, Franciscan friar. He landed at Tel Aviv, and he was asked, do you know any Iranians? This is what the, the airport security asked him. And he said, yes, write down their names and numbers. He said, no, get out of here. You're not coming into Israel. <laughs> the divine presence never moves from the Western Wall. Okay, No Christian on earth, if he wants to follow the teachings of the New Testament, can ever support such a statement. It is clear heresy. It is rank blasphemy. Here's a quote, actually, from the Christian, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Christ is the true temple of God, the place where his glory dwells. Ah, Kufi is Kufr. Here's Pastor John Hagee, founder and chairman, Christians United for Israel. It's based out of Texas. If you ever heard him speak, you just want to, it's like you want to run out of the room after 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, so Christian Zionism is a betrayal of the New Testament Jesus. So Zionism is a betrayal of the Old Testament teaching, and Zionism is a betrayal of the New Testament teaching. Here's another thing. John, in his gospel, he moved the day of the crucifixion up one day. So in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is crucified on the day of Passover, but John moved it to the previous day, which is the day of the preparation of the Passover. So there's a clear contradiction in the Gospels. Certainly Jesus wasn't crucified once. This is an irre irreconcilable contradiction. From our perspective, he wasn't even crucified. Uh, sorry, uh, certainly Jesus wasn't crucified twice. From our perspective, he wasn't even crucified once, but that's another topic. But, but why? Why did John move up the day of the crucifixion? Why? Because this was when the lambs in the temple were being slaughtered. Now, only in the Gospel of John do we find that a Roman centurion impaled the side of the crucified Jesus, from which came forth blood and water, says John. So what's the significance of that? Well, on that very day, at that very moment, the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover in the temple. The Kohanim, the priests, they would open a side gate and they would wash the blood out with water. Blood and water would gush forth from the side of the temple. So you see what John is doing in his gospel. He is depicting Jesus as both sacrificial lamb and temple. Jesus is the new temple.
Now, I don't agree with this Christology, obviously. Right? However, if Christians would just follow these teachings found in their own books, then they would have no reason to morally, theologically, financially, and militarily support the modern state of Israel, and the world would be a much better place. Christian Zionism is utter blasphemy, according to the New Testament. This is what we have to help our Christian friends, neighbors, and family members to realize. In 1 John 2.22, the author says, New Testament, who is the liar? Huh? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, hutas est in ha antichristas. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah is the Antichrist. This is the New Testament. This is not my opinion. This is not the Quran. This is not some hadith. This is the New Testament. I'll tell you a true story. Kind of a funny story. I tell this story a lot. I'm going to say it again. Okay. My wife gets annoyed at me when I tell stories over again. It's kind of a funny story, but also a bit disconcerting. I had, it was 6 o'clock in the morning. I was, I was during my PhD studying days. I had the Quran and the Bible on a table at Pete's Coffee. 6 o'clock in the morning. There's a long line behind me. There's a man standing behind me who looks over my shoulder. And he says, aha, nice books. I said, thank you. One of those books is from God and one is from Satan. So it's too early in the morning for this. And I said, OK. Well, which one's from God? <laughs> and he pointed to the Bible. I said, okay, the Quran is from Satan. He said, oh, yes. And I said, well, why do you say that? Well, he says, he, he, he said to me, the Bible teaches that anyone who opposes Israel will be accursed. So he's referring to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and I'll come back to that verse, okay? So he said, you know, these Palestinians in Israel, they're all antichrists. So I said, the Palestinians are antichrists? He said, Yes. So I said, does the Bible say that the Palestinians are antichrist? Does it use that word? He said, no, but it says that whoever opposes Israel will be accursed. So I said, well, the New Testament does mention the antichrist. Let's read 1 John 2.22. Right? So I read this verse to him. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the antichrist. So I said, you know these Palestinians, they're Muslims and Christians. You know who they believe Jesus was, right? You know who they believe the, the Messiah is? Jesus. But you know who doesn't? And he became enraged, right? And he, he was going to, like, attack me, right? Uh, and then his wife kind of grabbed him. I had my coffee ready to spill on his face. Too early in the morning. But why did he say that? Whoever, you know, whoever, um, whoever, uh, 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 opposes Israel is accursed. I'll come back to this idea. Very important idea. There's a reverend uh, Palestinian Christian pastor and professor living in Bethlehem right now in occupied West Bank. His name is Dr. Reverend Dr. Munzer Isaac. Right? This is a quote from him. Palestinian Christian living in Bethlehem. They, who's they? Christian Zionists. You're not talking about Muslims. You're not talking about you know, Hindus. They, Christian Zionists, turned the good news in Jil into our worst nightmare. According to the clear teachings of the New Testament, the Jews are no longer the chosen people exclusively. The New Testament advances something called replacement theology, covenantal supersessionism. Okay? Supersessionism is this idea that the Christian church has been super, uh, sorry, the Christian church has superseded the nation of Israel as God's covenant people. Of course, this is not a total replacement because Jews can still believe in Jesus, right? Now, Christian Zionists love to quote this, Genesis 12, 3, where God says to Abraham, and I will bless you that, and I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you, okay? Genesis 12, 3. So they take this to mean that they must bless Abraham and his chosen seed, the Israelites, or else God will curse them. In their minds, it follows then that if they don't bless and support the modern state of Israel, then God won't bless them. This is what they say. Where are they getting this from? I'll tell you later. The history is fascinating, inshallah. You know what's really interesting? In order for a Christian to immigrate to Israel, he must renounce Christianity. Israel will gladly accept Christian money with a huge smile. But in order for a Christian to move to Israel, the Christian has to admit that Jesus was a false prophet and a pseudo-Messiah. 
But this is what Christian Zionists say. We have a religious duty to love and support Israel. This is totally contradictory to the New Testament. Just read the letters of Paul of Tarsus. 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament are explicitly attributed to Paul, and Paul is a supersessionist to his very core. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 3.16 about God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis. Now, if you know anything about me, you know that I don't necessarily agree with Paul, to put it mildly, but this is what he says. And Christians are supposed to believe in Paul, not John Nelson Darby, not C.I. Schofield, and certainly not John Hagee. Paul says, quote, the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. And here the Christian Zionist says, amen. But Paul continues, scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. According to Paul, God in Genesis was only referring to Jesus Christ as being Abraham's seed. Only Jesus and the Christians who believe in him are blessed. Not the disbelieving Israelites, and certainly not the modern, genocidal, blasphemous state of Israel. Not Tel Aviv, that hosts the largest pride parade in the world, a hundred miles away from Sodom and Gomorrah, and who spitefully used the rainbow as a symbol of their de degeneracy. Of course, the rainbow was a sign of God's covenant with humanity in Genesis chapter 9. Paul goes on to say, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 to 29. That's called a conditional statement. In Greek, it says, A de hemes Christu. A epsilon iota is called a conditional particle. Huh? Conditional particle. If, if you belong to Christ, ara to Abraham, sperma este, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. Protasis, apotasis. If clause, then clause. Christians are the new chosen people, according to the New Testament. You are only chosen and blessed if you believe in Jesus. Of course, that's what he's saying. He's a Christian. And in Galatians, Paul makes this very interesting claim that Gentiles who believe in Jesus, so Greeks and Romans who believe in Jesus, are now the children of Sarah somehow, the free woman, as he says, while Jews, who are actually descendants of Isaac but did not accept Jesus, are now children of the bondswoman Hagar. Right? Look, I don't agree with Paul, but this is the teaching of the New Testament. 1 Peter 2.9, he says, but you, he's talking to Christians, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him, etc., etc. Hmm. Here, look here. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 and 15. Paul is writing to his Christian congregation in Thessalonica. Listen to what Paul says. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are now in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind. That is Paul. That is not the Quran. That is not the Hadith. What does Paul say about the Jews? They killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. They please not God and oppose all mankind. I'm sure that Christian apologists can defend these things. But why is it that we never hear these defenses? We are always on the defensive. Explain the verse of the sword, explain the so-called wife-beating verse, explain polygamy, explain jihad, explain this, explain that. We're always on the back foot. We need to rethink our strategic engagement with the public discourse. It's time for us to ask some questions, don't you think? We need to start asking questions. We've answered, I've, asked, I've answered a jihad question for 20 years. I'm done. If you don't know by now, then God help you. But I have a few questions, and there's more questions to come. I'll mention one more. In Romans 6 and Hebrews 10, Paul says that Jesus' sacrifice for sin was to be all end all. So Jesus is the ultimate temple, the ultimate high priest, and the ultimate sacrifice. This is New Testament Christianity. Yet Christian Zionists fully support the third temple where sin sacrifices will return one day, according to the Jewish messianism. 
How can followers of the New Testament Jesus and Paul of Tarsus support this and call themselves Bible-believing Christians? They can't. Christian Zionism is indefensible from a biblical perspective. We need to ask the Christian Zionists, are the Jews who wrote the Talmud still chosen and beloved by God? It's a simple question. Are these Jews still the apple of God's eye who cursed and slandered Jesus and his mother Mary in the Talmud? Read Jesus in the Talmud by Peter Schaefer, published by Princeton University. Actually, don't read it. It will make your skin crawl. You have to take my word for it. Ben Shapiro was on Joe Rogan, and Joe Rogan said to him, so who, Jesus was like a prophet according to you? He said, no, not a prophet. Just another Jewish guy who tried to start a rebellion against the Romans, and he was killed for his trouble. So when he said that, a lot of Muslims and Christians were offended. It is offensive. You know, Jesus was just another failed insurrectionist who died a criminal's death. But let me tell you this. What Shapiro said was the G-rated version of what his Talmud teaches about Jesus and Mary. However, for the sake of balancing my comments here, okay, and I'm not defending the Talmud, obviously, but we have to put its comments in, about Jesus into context. The rabbis who wrote these things were reacting to the New Testament Jesus. As well as, the Christ, uh, as well as the Jesus of Christian faith, okay? Not the historical Jesus of Nazareth, and not the real Isa salam. So this is really important. The New Testament Jesus, the Jesus of Christian faith claimed to be God. That is absolute blasphemy from a Jewish perspective. It is the height of kufr. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, any man claims to be God is a liar. So the Talmudic rabbis felt compelled to offer a sharp critique, but rather than using more academic and historical arguments, they opted for extremely depraved ad hominem attacks. Covenantal supersessionism was also the teachings of Christians throughout the centuries. Read John Chrysostom, uh, Augustine of Hippo, John Calvin, Martin Luther, the early church fathers from the East and the West, as well as pioneers of the Protestant Reformation, were all advocates of replacement theology to a certain extent. Martin Luther, the spearhead of the Protestant Reformation, wrote a treatise called On the Jews and Their Lies. And you'll be shocked to your core what he says about the Jews. You won't believe your eyes. Luther went way far to end off the deep end, right? Despite Luther being the main force of the Protestant uh, movement, most Christians are absolutely right to reject his hateful anti-Jewish rants. However, most Protestants are absolutely wrong to reject Luther's main contention that the Jews who disbelieve in Jesus as the Messiah are no longer chosen by God. Why are they wrong? Because this is the clear-cut teaching of the New Testament. So here's the bottom line. Z Zionism is kufr according to the New Testament. And according to traditional Christianity, it is kufr. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells the Jews, it says, no longer scribes and Pharisees, the Jews. It says, hoi iodaioi, the Jews. He tells the Jews that if they were truly Abraham's seed, they would do the works of Abraham. In other words, the true seed of Abraham are those who follow Abraham. Then he says to them, no, you are children of your father, the devil because you seek to kill me. Abraham did not do this. That's the New Testament Jesus. The Jews who disbelieve in Jesus are the seed of Satan, according to the New Testament Jesus. This is not Quran, not Hadith. It was New Testament passages like this that prompted the Talmudic rabbis to say what they said. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, says the New Testament Jesus. This is the teaching of the New Testament. I don't agree with this teaching, and I do not believe that the historical Jesus ever taught these things. But why is it that we almost never hear Christians defending these things? We have to ask a question. Are you embarrassed? Are you afraid? Do you consider these teachings indefensible? Perhaps Jesus was being hyperbolic here. Do you consider these things anti-Semitic? If so, why do you continue to believe in them? I was on a panel once, and a Christian next to me was asked this question, and he said, yes, in the New Testament Gospels, there is vitriolic anti-Semitism. 
This is a pastor of a church who believes in the New Testament. Well, if he believes that there is vitriolic anti-Semitism in the New Testament, yet he believes in the New Testament, then guess what? He is ipso facto an anti-Semite. <laughs> is that the answer he wants to give? Give me something else. Give me something. Nothing. Fear. Here. There's Martin Luther, the pioneer of the Protestant Reformation. This is one of the more mild quotes from his book on the Jews and their lies. The Council of Florence, the 17th Ecumenical Church Council, is very clear that the Old Testament sacrifices, that is to say the ceremonial law of the Israelites, is dead and deadly. That's the phrase used by Catholic theologians. In other words, the sacrifices are done with, they're dead, they're abrogated, mansuch. And it is deadly to the salvation of Christians if they bring back those sacrifices. Because it is tantamount to denying what Jesus did. It is to deny that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. So you see what Zionism does. It takes the promise that God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and it skips the entire New Testament and applies it to the modern, murderous nation-state of Israel. Blasphemy. Total blasphemy. Obviously, I don't believe that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. I think this is a gravely mistaken theology. But Pauline, New Testament believing Christians are supposed to believe that. And if they truly did, they would not support Zionism. It's bad theology, but at least they wouldn't be war hawking for Israel. At least they wouldn't have innocent blood on their hands. Our new Speaker of the House in America, Mike Johnson, who identifies as an evangelical Christian Zionist, recently said that America has a religious duty to support Israel. Blasphemy. Blasphemy according to the New Testament. Christian Zionist is an oxymoron. Okay? It's like open secret. You understand? Original copy. Living dead. What's another one? Huh? Jumbo shrimp. Yeah, so we said that. Jumbo shrimp. Yeah. Um, Buddhist rabbi. Right? What? Christian Zionist. Now, how did the Christians get to this point? Now, before I get to the brief history, it's important to touch upon the geopolitical implications of Christian Zionism. Millions upon millions of Christian Zionists supported the war on Iraq for theological reasons, because it was in Israel's best interest. What is Israel's best interest? Well, it's laid out in something called the Yinon Plan. You see that? Written in 1982 by Oded Yinon, former Israeli foreign minister. It is in Israel's best interest to destabilize and weaken the Arab nations that support Israel, what they call Greater Israel. What is Greater Israel from the Nile in Egypt to the Euphrates in Iraq? Read the Yinon plan. It's all there. Of course, the American public was sold a pack of lies about WMDs, total lies, blood libel, absolutely disgraceful. We had these Christian Zionist leaders and preachers on television with millions of followers stoking hatred for Arabs, hatred for Muslims, offering these half-witted and ridiculous futuristic interpretations of biblical verses, which they claimed were referring to Iraq and Saddam Hussein, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, all for the glory and protection of Israel. War hawking for Israel by means of bad theology. War hawking for Israel by means of bad theology. This is a murderous ideology. Christian Zionism is a murderous ideology. Who said that? Dr. Stephen Sizer, Bible-believing Christian. He wrote a book called Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon. That's exactly what it is. It's a roadmap to Armageddon. How did Zionism become so popular among American Protestants? Well, in 1831, an Anglican preacher named John Nelson Darby was one of the primary organizers of a non-denominational Christian movement called the Plymouth Brethren. Okay, this is what happens when church tradition is ignored. Interestingly, interesting historical tidbit, the parents of Aleister Crowley were devoted members of the Plymouth Brethren at one point, even Crowley himself as a child. If you don't know who that is, look it up. Darby is considered to be the father of something called modern dispensationalism. Okay, 
modern dispensationalism. Here he is, John Nelson Darby. Okay, what is modern dispensationalism? Basically, it's this notion, okay, that there will be a future restoration of the earthly nation of Israel. But this also includes this idea that the Mosaic Covenant and the Christian Covenant, the Christic Covenant, are two valid coexisting covenants. Both, they are both valid covenants. It's called dual covenant theology. In other words, Christians do not need to convert Jews. Jews already have a valid covenant. Jews are still the chosen people, irrespective of their belief in Jesus. You see? This is radical. Think about the theological implications of this for Christianity. This implies that Christ came only for the Gentiles, not the Jews. That's the implication. It actually directly contradicts the New Testament Jesus. I was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Also, Christ is not the Savior for all, only for the Gentiles. So John 3.16, for God so loved the world, should really say, for God so loved the Gentiles that he gave his only begotten son, because the Jews don't need him, at least not yet. So according to Darby, let's get into his dispensational doctrine. Okay, History, sacred history, is divided into seven dispensations, seven periods of time that demonstrate how God deals with humanity. He calls these innocence, this is from creation to the fall, conscience, number two, conscience, from the fall to the flood, civil government from the flood to Abraham, promise from Abraham to Moses, number five, the law of Moses, from Moses to the cross, okay, number five, from Moses to the cross. Number six, he calls grace, right, from the cross to the rapture, I'll talk about the rapture, also known as the church age. Grace is also known as the church age. It goes from the cross to the rapture. Okay. Finally, number seven, the kingdom, the millennium, when Christ will rule from Jerusalem after his second coming. This is described in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Now, what is this last dispensation? The kingdom. So the kingdom, also known as the millennium, is the literal 1,000-year future reign of Christ from Jerusalem that Christ will rule the reconstituted physical ethnic Jewish state of Israel. So national Israel will be restored according to Darby. According to Darby, the Old Testament prophesizes not so much the church age, but really the kingdom, the millennium, where Jesus rules the national Jewish state of Israel. So according to Darby and eschatology, the rapture will occur. Okay, this is based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What is the rapture? The church, the believers in Jesus are sort of removed from the earth. They're taken up, right? So if you're Christian, you don't want to be left behind, right? You ever heard of the book series Left Behind? Then there's going to be a horrible seven-year period known as the tribulation. This is apparently described in Matthew and in Revelation. So this is a time of massive and widespread evil upon the earth. During the tribulation, the Antichrist emerges, who will sit in the temple, the third temple. This is what Paul says. And he will declare himself God. Now, this is unique in Darby, such that Christians will be gone before the tribulation. Right? They're going to be raptured before the tribulation. This is called pre-trib eschatology. The rapture is pre-trib. Okay, so there's pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib eschatology. In other words, the rapture is either before, in the middle of, or after the tribulation. Okay? So for Darby, Christians will experience none of the evils of the tribulation. Then the parousia, parousia, where the second coming occurs, the second coming of Jesus. Then the earthly, then, sorry, then the kingdom or the millennium will manifest. So the second coming is pre-millennial. The second coming is prior to the kingdom. Okay, there was an opinion among Protestants that the second coming was post-millennial, that the kingdom would manifest by God's grace bef uh, before the second coming uh, um, of Jesus, which, which meant basically that the whole world was about to sort of repent and accept Christ 
uh, through Christian um, evangelizing. And then the world would become, and then the world would sort of welcome Jesus with open arms. This was very popular up until the 20th century and then World War I, World War II, etc. And now almost no one takes this position. No one takes the position that the, that the second coming is post-mill. Okay, for most Christians, now like Catholics, okay, for Catholics, the kingdom is already here. Okay, so the kingdom of God and the church age are essentially uh, synonymous. Okay, so Christ is ruling over it right now. So they take this language of the millennium to be symbolic. It's not a literal uh, thousand year earthly reign. It's a spiritual reality and we are in it right now. Now the book of Revelation <clears throat> states, however, that Satan will be bound during the millennium. So how is Satan bound right now? Well, Satan is bound in the sense that he cannot prevent people from receiving the gospel. This is the position of the Catholics. This is called a millennial millennialism. A millennialism. So again, essentially a Catholic position. Also, there's no rapture in the Protestant sense. So when Christ comes back, he will not rule for a thousand years. So come back and judge humanity, judge the nations immediately. The righteous will then be taken body and soul into heaven. We can call that a rapture, if you will. And the evil ones, including Satan and his demons, will go to hell. The book of Revelation calls it the lake of fire. So that's, that's the most Christians, Catholic Christians. Okay, back to Darby. So Darby advanced a pre-trib, pre-mill dispensational eschatology. Again, what does that mean? That means the rapture will occur before the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus will occur before the millennium, the literal 1,000-year kingdom period. Darby was also a dual covenant dispensationalist. What does that mean? Again, the Mosaic Covenant and the Christic Covenant are two valid coexisting covenants. They're both valid. Okay? When Jesus returns to rule over national Israel, all of Israel will believe in him. There's going to be a reversal. Almost all of them disbelieved him the first time, the second time they'll all believe in him. Now, this is really important. Okay. Darby was famous for saying that the Bible must be rightly divided. What he meant was that much of the New Testament does not actually apply to Christians, but actually only to Jews. So remember that the fifth dispensation goes from Moses to the cross, right? The fifth dispensation is called the Law of Moses. It starts with Moses and ends at the cross. In other words, from Moses to the crucifixion, salvation is through adherence to the law of Moses. So according to Darby, the earthly teachings of Jesus found primarily in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were advancing the Mosaic covenant because Jesus lived during the fifth dispensation. You see, Jesus had not yet been crucified. But in Paul's letters, after the crucifixion, Paul was teaching the New Covenant in the Sixth Dispensation. So there are two Gospels. This was Darby's teaching. There are basically two versions of the Gospel. One for Jews, which is essentially a reinforcement of the Mosaic Covenant, and one Gospel for Gentiles, which is what Paul wrote about, salvation through belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, Jesus was teaching both dispensations. One while he was alive in Galilee and Judea, and one through his so-called apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, after his resurrection. Both covenants are valid side by side. So, in Matthew, for example, Jesus says, follow the commandments and you shall enter the life. Right? Follow the Mosaic mitzvot. That's the Mosaic Covenant of the fifth dispensation. But Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.9. That's the Christic Covenant in the sixth dispensation. Is that a bit clear? What's happening here? Now, I think Darby was actually onto something. I agree with Darby that Jesus and Paul were teaching two different Gospels. Right? I've been saying this for years. But it is not because there are, in fact, two different Gospels. 
there are two versions of the Gospels. It's because Paul's Gospel is a false Gospel, a pseudo-Gospel. This is why Paul's enemies, according to his own letters, were Jerusalem-based apostles and men from James, as he says. James, of course, was the brother of Jesus, the successor of Jesus, the leader of the Nazarenes for over 30 years. Paul was an unauthorized, freelance, self-proclaimed apostle of Jesus, or as the Ebionites used to call him, the apostate Paul. So Darby rightly, correctly, saw that Jesus and Paul were teaching two different things. But Darby, as a Christian, he had to somehow reconcile this contradiction, you see. As a Christian, Darby believed that the New Testament, the Gospels, and all the Pauline corpus were true and totally accurate. That is the real problem. Right? The Quran says their alterations, their fabrications in their own books have deluded them about their own religion. When you have fabrications in your text, you're going to try to reconcile things and it's going to lead you more into balala. Darby's solution was to claim that the New Testament advances two covenants, one for Jews and one for Gentiles. That's not the right solution. The right solution is to take Jesus over Paul and then compare the Christology of the Quran with the Christology of the earliest Christians and become Muslim. So for Darby, God, in effect, put the Jews on a timeout. They're on a timeout. Go to your room. He didn't replace them. He put them on a timeout. When the Christians of the sixth dispensation are raptured, and Christ returns, then God will turn his attention back to his chosen people, Israel, and Jesus will rule over them as king, the king they always wanted, and they will finally believe in him as the true Messiah. So those Old Testament passages that describe the future kingdom will finally be fulfilled. Okay, so that's Darby in a nutshell. Now Darby's dispensationalism eventually found its way across the pond to America. Remember, this started off as a very small group of poor Christians in England called the Plymouth Brethren. An American pastor named Clarence Larkin absolutely fell in love with Darby's doctrines. And he wrote a famous book called Dispensational Truth. This book is very famous for its elaborate and highly perplexing charts and symbols. So Larkin, he tried to illustrate Darby's dispensationalism to make it a bit easier to follow, at least that was probably his intention. Another American pastor, James Hall Brooks, also fell in love with Darby. Brooks was in uh, St. Louis. Now there was an annual Bible conference called the Niagara Bible Conference, and Brooks was often the keynote speaker. Okay, so it was at this conference where Darbyan dispensationalism became more and more popular via James Brooks. Brooks had a popular preacher friend named Dwight Moody. He would later establish the famous Moody Bible Institute, which still operates today in Chicago, where Bible is their middle name, as Bart Ehrman always says. Moody also became a Darbyan dispensationalist. And Moody befriended a man named Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. The chief trickster. Schofield was a morally questionable lawyer and politician. He was accused of multiple charges of theft, bribery, forgery, extortion. He was also a deadbeat husband and father, a self-described alcoholic, turned Christian minister. So he abandoned his wife and children. Anti-Zionist Christians, listen to this, anti-Zionist Christians, they quote 1 Timothy 5.8, when speaking of Schofield, this is what 1 Timothy 5.8 says, ready? Anyone who does not provide for his relatives, especially his own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. <laughs> this is what Paul says in 1 Timothy 5.8. Schofield, according to the Bible, is worse than an infidel. Anyway, Schofield became an ordained pastor in Dallas in 1883. In 1888, he wrote a treatise called Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Ah. He also started calling himself C.I. Schofield, D.D., that is Doctor of Divinity, although there is no record of him ever graduating from seminary. 
So it seemed like he gave himself an honorary doctorate, right? It's kind of like what Dartmouth College did for Dr. Seuss. You know, Dr. Seuss was not a real doctor. CI school through, at least Dr. Seuss admitted he wasn't a real doctor. In 18, sorry, 1909, Schofield wrote his Schofield Study Bible, published by Oxford. This Bible, the Schofield Study Bible, had a massive, massive impact on American Protestants and Evangelicals. It is no exaggeration that this Bible turned millions of American Protestants into Christian Zionists. It changed a generation of preachers. His Bible is essentially the King James translation, but with a lot of his own strange commentary. He didn't change the translation. It's his notes. Okay? Oxford, at, at one point, was giving out these Bibles for free. What's going on there? It was his commentary of Genesis 12.3, God's promise to Abraham that I mentioned earlier, that changed the whole game. Okay? And God said to Abraham, and curse those who curse you. Schofield said, quote, wonderfully fulfilled in the history of the dispersion. It has invariably fared ill with the people who have persecuted the Jew. Well with those who have protected him. The future will still more remarkably prove this principle. After Schofield, it became ubiquitous among Protestants and that, among Protestants that Christians owe unconditional and unquestionable loyalty to the Jewish people because they never cease to be chosen. This is Schofield's commentary. And so this doggish Christian loyalty, this pathetic, almost slavish Christian loyalty to ethnic Jews extends to the modern murderous state of Israel. Because eventually, Jesus will rule Israel. That's Jesus' future kingdom. But as we said, in light of the New Testament, the book of Galatians in particular, this is a grave misreading of the text of Genesis chapter 12. According to the New Testament, the church is the new Israel. The church is a new Zion, which can and does include some ethnic Jews. But belief in Jesus is without question. You have to believe in Jesus. The sine qua non of being chosen by God is having belief in Jesus. According to the New Testament, the Last Supper, the pronouncement and initiation of the New Covenant occurred on Mount Zion on Holy Thursday. The descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost occurred in that same room about 50 days later on Mount Zion. So both the establishment of the New Covenant as well as the proclamation of the New Covenant happened on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So you see what the authors of the New Testament are saying. The Christian church is the new Zion. When Thomas Aquinas wrote his hymns praising Zion, he was praising the Christian church, not some future secular Jewish ethnostate. How did Schofield do it? In 2005, Joseph Canfield wrote a biography about Schofield. It's called The Incredible Schofield and His Book. <laughs> so according to Canfield, in 1901, Schofield joined an exclusive men's only secret society called the Lotus Club. Canfield suggests that someone highly influential within the club, he thinks a lawyer named Samuel Untermeyer, basically promoted and financed Schofield's Bible project. In other words, Schofield had powerful American Zionists bankrolling his project. Schofield was the textbook definition of what's known as a useful idiot. Someone who is used by powerful people to do their bidding without really understanding the consequences of his actions. In 1948, when Israel became a state, Darbian dispensationalism through Schofield exploded even more in popularity among Western Protestants. You see, Israel has been restored, just as Darby said. This just further vindicated dispensationalism. And so the Christian Zionists were saying, we better be nice to Israel or else God will curse us. According to Genesis 12.3, we better be nice to Israel because it is Jesus's future kingdom. But what did Paul say? The Antichrist will sit in the third temple in Jerusalem. The Christ? The Antichrist. One of Schofield's students was named Louis Chafer. 
Schaefer founded the Dallas Theological Seminary in 1924. He was the president of the DTS until 1952. A famous alumnus of, of Dallas Theological Seminary is a man named Hal Lindsey. He's still alive. In 1973, Lindsey wrote a book that would take the world by storm. It had the power of 30 Harry Potters. It was called The Late Great Planet Earth. Millions upon millions of copies were sold. It seemed that all of America was reading this book about end times prophecies in the Bible through the lens of Darbian dispensationalism. It was even made into a movie narrated by Orson Welles. Hal Lindsey, by the way, the author, he said in 1979 that Jesus will return in 1988. So there's a, <laughs> there's a verse in Matthew 24 where Jesus says, This generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. The present generation will live to see it all. Uh, apparently, Jesus was speaking of the restored kingdom. So one generation is 40 years. The restored kingdom, 1948, restoration of national Israel, also called the Nakba, plus 40 equals 1988. Never happened. The New Schofield Study Bible, published by Oxford University Press in 1984, added the following clarifying comment. Okay, listen to this. <clears throat> For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings inevitable judgment. The Ajib. The New Testament Jesus said that the only unforgivable sin was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, in today's zeitgeist, we are constantly told that any critique of Zionism is anti-Semitic, right? So anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism. This is what we're told. So then Christians who read that note from Schofield must only conclude that anti-Zionism is the unforgivable sin in the sight of God. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism, a form of which is anti-Zionism, brings inevitable judgment. You see how they were hoodwinked? Ah, there he is. I circled the DD. <laughs> He's not a doctor. Mm -hmm. In his commentary of Hosea 1.10, Schofield wrote, I'll give you a few examples. Okay? He wrote, Quote, the expression, my people, ammi in Hebrew, is used in the Old Testament exclusively of Israel, the nation. He's wrong. Demonstrably wrong. Isaiah 19.25, ready? Baruch ammi Mitzrayim. Blessed be Egypt, my people. Whatever that means, it means what it means, but he's wrong. In his commentary on Genesis, Schofield wrote, listen to this one. The Palestinian covenant gives the conditions under which Israel, he means, he means physical Israel, entered the land of promise. It is important to see that the nation has never as yet taken the land under the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, nor has it ever possessed the whole land. Wrong. Let's read Joshua 21.43. So the Lord gave Israel all the land, kol ha'eretz in Hebrew, kol ha'eretz, all the land that he had sworn to their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. What is Schofield doing here? Schofield wants us to think that this is still an outstanding promise, that God has not yet fulfilled his side of the deal and has not given this land to Israel yet. But he had, he did, and they were kicked out. And they must stay in exile. Schofield said, two dispossessions and restorations have been accomplished. Israel is now in the third dispersion from which she will be restored at the return of the Lord as king. So according to Schofield, the future kingdom will be given to the Jews, okay? According to Schofield, the future kingdom will be given to the Jews. But in Matthew, Jesus says to the Jews, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you. So Christians need to ask themselves, Schofield or scripture? But then the problem becomes, if you go with scripture, there are problems with the integrity, preservation, and accuracy of the text. 
there's another problem. The only solution is to become Muslim, basically, what Brown is trying to say here. Because if, if you want to discover the historical Jesus, it's very different than what Paul says, you'll become Muslim naturally. This is what historians say. Just don't take my word for it. Okay. Any questions, Christian Zionism? What time is our next break? Well, it's almost two. We can take it. Maybe take a couple questions. Okay. Let's let's take a couple questions and then we'll take a short break, and then we'll do the conclusion. Inshallah, we're coming down to the end. Yes, sir. Um, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, so it looks like that uh, the problem of the European problems that uh, they used to hate the Jews. Um, it came back, came down to the um, in Arab in uh, area, right? Um, so, so it's really ironic that you know um, the the people of uh, of Palestine in that area, um, they're the one that who uh, yeah. accepted them, and now, right? You know, exactly. And very it ironic. Is, it's very ironic. Um, the second thing is that um, the, the second question is that maybe you might want to maybe can, can, can highlight it. So, Palestine land is to me actually two part, right? One from the um, the religious point of view, how you, you explained, right? Second part isn't that also part of that the um, the resources that. Um, that was developed and that was found uh, in around 1930s to you know during the Second World War that you know in Arab land does have uh, resources there, so they want to control that part. So there, so the two things that got merged uh, from the uh, from the religious point of view, but again there the resources that we have that's what the Zionism that uh, combined together. That's because, in, as you know, that we came to know, like, you know, it is there in the internet, right? Then Biden mentioned that um, they, they give uh, Israel $3 billion every day. If Israel doesn't do that work, they will create another Israel, right? Yeah. Sort of, I mean, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the, in my point is that is that there are two things that are getting combined from the religious yeah. point of view, and then, you know, they want to capture that. Geopolitics. Yeah. Yeah, primarily British and the British... You know, they, they, were, they were Zionists, they, they were Christian, you know, fundamentalists and dispensationalists. But the military, primarily, according to Dr. Rashid Khalidi, they were interested in geopolitics. They were interested in imperialism and how to control that area, to protect India, to protect Egypt, things like that. You're right, it's emerging, a merging of religions, a re religious fanaticism with imperialistic aspirations. It's like a perfect storm. And who suffered Palestinians? People who let them in. You're right. Hadrian kicked them out. It was the Muslims in the seventh century that let the Jews back into Jerusalem. And they admit this. This is not some secret. This is something that's open. One of my teachers said the Palestinians are being slaughtered on the altar for the sins of Europe. The Pascal lamb slaughtered on the altar for the sins of Europe. Ajib. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. So I'm wondering what uh, authority Darby uh, has to come up with these theories and then have them be kind of accepted. But I mean, are, are they? Because I mean, it seems to me it's kind of the equivalence of like ijtihad for. Oh, definitely. Muslim. And and, and yeah. it, how does that work in the in the Christian? faith. Well, that's, that's the problem. What I mentioned earlier is this is what happens when, when tradition is ignored. So everyone used to be Catholic, and the Catholic Church has a strong tradition. It's called the magisterium. So you're not, you're not allowed to go into the Bible and say, I think this means that or this. You can't do that. You know, you, to be a, quote, mufassir of the Bible, you have to have certain uh, prerequisite knowledge, just like in our tradition, right? Uh, in Jizay al-Kalbi, he says you need to, to master 12, or 12 to 15 ulum to give your opinion about the Quran. This is, this is a weighty thing. But with Protestantism, right, it's this detachment, this rebellion against church tradition and becomes almost you know, Bible only, right? Sola Scriptura, only scripture. 
So now this gives license to individual Christians to interpret the Bible how they want. So Darby is in that milieu, right? And so when he comes up with this, and I think it was motivated from a good place, I actually think that. I think that he was being honest with the text and he's saying, look, Jesus and Paul are saying two different things. I have to admit it. But it's all the word of God. So how do I, how do I deal with this? How do I reconcile this? And it could have just died with him, but for some reason, there were American pastors who heard of him, invited him to America, and it just ex exploded during that time. He, he, was, he was a preacher. He was one of the founders of the Plymouth Brethren, whatever that means, you know. So no, you know, the, there's, the, the Protestants don't have these, I mean, there's something of a structure, but not as rigid as in the Catholic Church, where there's a, you know, there's a, there's a the, the laity, and there's a, there's a deacon, and there's a, you know, a priest, and you have a bishop, an archbishop, you have a cardinal, the pope, it's, it's, there's, there must be hierarchy, you know. Let's take a, should we take a uh, We have some online questions. We have Let's a lot of people one. online. Uh, we have more in the room. How many more do we like to take? Let's take one online. We'll take a break. Okay. Don't anti-Zionist Jews believe in the same thing as the Zionist Jews when the Messiah comes? When all nations go into slavery? Do anti-Zionist Jews believe the same? Not necessarily, no. So, um... If you, for example, if you listen to uh, rabbis of the Natura Carta International, like uh, Rabbi David uh, Weiss, he'll say that the temple will be built by God himself, and there's going to be a change, a metaphysical change in the world, uh, where, um, where basically um, there's going to be sort of peace on earth in a supernatural sense. Okay, so there's that opinion, but yes, there is also opinion that at the end of times, when the Messiah comes, he's going to fight the Milchamat Adonai, which means the, the wars of the Lord, right? And generally, rabbis believe, or Orthodox believe, even traditional Orthodox I'm talking about, they believe in two Messiahs. This is mentioned in the Talmud, right? So just as, as we, we have things in our hadith of the end of time, right, that are a bit, you know, controversial and things like that, they're talking about their eschat eschatological hadith. They have those two. Right? So they believe in two messiahs, a Josephine messiah, the Mashiach ben Yosef who's going to come, he's going to fight Edom, which means Christianity, Europe, he's going to be killed by them, and then the Mashiach ben David is going to come, the Davidic messiah who's going to fight, the, he's going to fight Ishmael, the Muslims, the Arabs. Yeah, it's, that's going to happen. Right? But for the time being, it is absolutely against traditional Judaism to reestablish any state without the coming of the messiah. They have to wait for the messiah. And the Quran says something interesting. That about Isa alayhi salam, that there is none of the people of the book that won't believe in him uh, prior to his death. So according to the Quran, when Isa alayhi salam comes again, uh, there's going to be a point where all Jews and Christians will believe in him as a true Messiah and the true prophet of God. It may not be immediate, but eventually it's going to get to that point. So yes, there's going to be tension. We all believe in this, in this sort of end of time tension. Yes, it's going to happen. But the question is, how do we live right now? How are we supposed to live right now? By our tradition. And if Christians and Jews and Muslims would just adhere to their long-standing normative tradition, it would make for a much better world. Even though we don't agree. Lekum dinakum liyadin. Yeah, I don't, agree. I don't agree Jesus is, a, is a, the temple. I don't believe that he died for my sins. I don't believe that, but that's Christian tradition. And if Christians would just simply believe that and be courageous enough to believe that, they wouldn't support Zionism. Okay, so before I get into what I think is actually happening right now sort of in Palestine theologically vis-a-vis -vis radical Judaism, uh, I want to make a few comparisons, because comparisons are very helpful. They put things in a proper perspective. And they really help me understand things, right? So I always use the comparison that if I say that a baseball player gets on base 40% of his at-bats, right? Someone who doesn't know anything about baseball might think 40%, that's, that's horrible. Like, if I get a 40% of my math test, I fail. But in fact, a 400 batting average is pretty great, right? So he needs to compare it to something meaningful. Right, the average batting average is 
260. So now he understands. So the total number of people killed or, or who died, really killed, in all of the military campaigns of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, Muslim and non-Muslim, was about 1,000 to 1,100, give or take. And these were men on the battlefield. Okay. Now by comparison, the United States of America dropped two bombs on Japan, killing 300,000 civilians on impact. So think about that. Just think about the violence. It was never the practice of the Prophet Muhammad to target civilians in wartime, and certainly never women and children. This is ma'lum, this is just known, and any Muslim who does so is in clear violation of the teachings of the Prophet The Prophet is the role model and exemplar for the Muslims. On the day of Uhud, right, he said, Allahumma ahdi qawmi fa innuhum la ya'lamun, with blood dripping down his face, O oh God, guide my people for they don't know. When the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, he said, Al yawma yawmul marhama, yu'izzullahu Qurayshan. Today is a day of mercy, <clears throat> marhama. The exaltation of the Quraysh, la tathriba alaykum al yawm, there's no blemish on you today. And he declared general amnesty. This is the Prophet ﷺ in a position of power. Years earlier, when he was stoned out of Ta'if by slaves and children of Bani Thaqif, he refused to curse them. Oh, he prayed for their descendants. By comparison, there's a story in the Bible, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, you might have heard this. This is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 2. This is a story that Jews and Christians believe in. There's a Hebrew prophet named Elisha who's leaving Jericho. I'll just read the NIV translation. And he, Elisha, was walking along the road. Some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. They said, get out of here, Baldy. Get out of here, Baldy. So they made fun of him, his bald spot. Now, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was leaving Ta'if, they were insulting him, they were punching him and kicking him, throwing stones at him. He was covered in blood. What did this Hebrew prophet do according to 2 Kings chapter 2? Again, it's mentioned in the Bible, and every time I mention a statement, I have to say, I'm not making this up, and I'm not saying this to ridicule anyone's religion. I'm mentioning this in order to draw an effective comparison. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys, 42 boys mauled to death by two bears. Imagine the carnage, the screams, the, the terror, the violence. Now after 9-11, for those of us who remember, a group of anti-Muslim warmongering profligates emerged in the public discourse. And they were paid handsomely by several neocon think tanks. And they would quote the so-called Ayatul Saif from the Quran, chapter 9, verse 5. And they tried to convince the American people and the entire West by extension that Muslims believe in unmitigated perpetual warfare against unbelievers. And that the Quran orders all Muslims to kill every non-Muslim on the planet, men, woman, and child. Because the Quran says, Kill the, uh, kill the idolaters wherever you find them. And if Muslims deny this, they're lying. That's called taqiyya, prudential concealment. There were popular TV shows where they would depict, you know, the seemingly normal and peaceful family, Muslim family next door, who were really terrorists, absolutely despicable. So this was how the so-called wars of terror against Muslims were justified for the Western public. 4.7 million Muslims have been killed in these wars of terror in the last 20 years. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, etc., 4.7 million based on a lie, the ultimate blood libel, and the Jewish people understand the power of a blood libel. In medieval Europe, okay, check this out, the Christians made up the infamous lie that Jews kidnap and kill Christian children and use their blood for magical rituals and in the making of the unleavened Passover bread. You can look up William of Norwich, Simon of Trent. Some of these children were even canonized by the Catholic Church. This was a common blood libel in England, France, Spain, Germany. This lie contributed to massive persecution of European Jewry. Edward I eventually expelled the entire Jewish population of England in 1290. But it was all a lie. You know, it's like saying Muslims decapitate babies. A blood libel. But I'll come back to that. Back to Ayatul Saif. When we look at the context of that verse in the Quran, its plain and obvious meaning becomes clear that the Quran is referring to the pagan Arabs in the Hijaz who broke their treaty with the Muslims. 
they were given four months to leave or face retaliation from the Muslims. And if at any point a mushrik asked for asylum from the Muslims, he must be granted asylum. This is according to the passage in Surah Tawbah. Take him to a place of safety and recite the Quran to him. And if he refuses Islam, then take him to the border of the city and release him. So 9-5 has a locative condition. It applies to the Hijaz, the heartland of Islam, the cities of Mecca and Medina. There can be no outward idolatry in these places. And they could have even stayed if they stopped worshipping idols. No killing of the innocent. No killing of women and children is mentioned. No destroying buildings and livestock. And if a handful of ignorant Muslim extremists invoke this verse as a justification for the killing of civilians, then they stand condemned. These mutatarrifun, these extremists, have to twist and turn the Quran and Sunnah to coincide with their deviance. Show me where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, ordered the killing of women and children. Nowhere. Now, there is a war policy mentioned and explicitly described in the Tanakh, Hebrew Bible, several times, called Kherem. This is a word that we all have to know. Where is this word mentioned? Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, 1 Samuel, Isaiah. It's all over the place. Not once, not twice, not three times, not five times, not ten times. What does Kherem mean? According to academic sources, the strongest concordance, Kherem, to ban, devote, destroy utterly, completely destroy, dedicate for destruction, exterminate. The Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew English Lexicon. This is used in seminaries all over the West. This is what I used years ago in Hebrew class. Did you use this one? Even up until last year, this is what they're using. Cherem, to exterminate the massacre of all inhabitants. Jusinius' Hebrew Chaldee Lexicon to the Old Testament. This was a long time ago. Cherem, to extirpate. I had to look that one up. Eradicate, eliminate, to destroy utterly. What's an example of Hedem? Deuteronomy 20, 16 and 17. So here God is telling Moses that the cities that God gave to the Israelites as an inheritance, okay, so the promised land, all living things of these cities must be exterminated. In the very words of the text, Lo techiye kol neshama, you shall, not, you shall save alive, you shall save nothing alive that breathes. It continues, but you shall utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God has commanded thee. So, total extermination explicitly ordered by the text. Explicitly. Genocide explicitly ordered by the text. In its plain and obvious meaning, you do not have to twist and turn it. This is what it says on the surface. I mentioned the conquest of Mecca earlier, right? But now, but I wonder how many viewers have heard of the conquest of uh, Jericho. Here, Joshua chapter 6, verse 21. Vayacharimu, this is how it begins. Vayacharimu, that's a verb, it's related to the word cherem. You shall utterly destroy. Efkol asher ba'ir, everything in the city. Me'ish va'ad isha, man and woman. Min na'ar va'ad zakain, both young and old. Fa'ad shor, vaseh, vachamor, an ox and sheep and donkey, lafi kharev, with the edge of the sword. Think about this. Can you possibly imagine this? Impaling women, impaling children with swords and spears, impaling toddlers and babies. Today they use bombs. This is called kherem. Here's the point. The wholesale slaughter of innocent civilians as a policy of war is sanctioned by Jewish and Christian texts. Deuteronomy 20, Joshua 6, 1 Samuel 15 are Jewish and Christian texts. A Christian apologist might say, no, 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 Deuteronomy 20 is, a, is not a Christian text. It's a Jewish text. Right? It's in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. This is a tactic. This is an obfuscation. Christians claim that there is one God, okay, and that it is the same God in both Testaments. They also believe that the Old Testament was inspired by this one God. Who is this God? The God of Abraham. Christians claim that this God is a triune God. He's a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
Trinitarians also believe in the doctrine of perichoresis. Perichoresis. This is the intercommunion, interpenetration of the three persons of the Trinity. It means that they are inseparable in action and of one mind. In other words, when they act, they always act together and they never disagree. Therefore, God, Father, Son, and Spirit, ordered cherem in the Old Testament, and the Son here is also known as the Logos, and the Logos incarnated into the flesh of a man named Jesus of Nazareth. So there is no escaping this. Here's a book recommendation. Uh, Professor Philip Jenkins, I didn't mention him on the slide. Philip Jenkins, it's called Laying Down the Sword, Why We Can't Ignore the Bible's Violent Verses. This is a must read. And Jenkins, he's a Christian, he calls Cherem, quote, a mass human sacrifice. Now you might ask, but didn't I quote Deuteronomy earlier to support my contention? So is the Bible accurate or not? Okay, well, Islam has the answer for the state of the Bible. The Quran is called the Muhaymin, the overseer, the supervisor of the Bible. The Quran is the Furqan, the standard of judgment when it comes to the Bible. And the Quran refers to the tahrif of the biblical text, alteration, fabrication, decontextualization. The text of the Bible has been corrupted to a certain significant degree. So here, we as Muslims, okay, have a major difference of opinion with anti-Zionist Haredi Jews, right? This is a major point of disagreement. For the Haredi, the text of the Torah is sound and authentic, but the Zionists have corrupted the meanings. Okay, in other words, for the Haredi, there is tahrif of the ma'na of the Torah and not of the nas. In other words, the text is sound, the meanings, the tafsir is wrong. Okay. For us, the tahrif of the Torah is both of the nas and the ma'na. That's the dominant opinion. And obviously, if the former is there, if the text is wrong, the ma'na will be corrupted as well. Right? And this is totally mainstream historical scholarship of the Bible. It took historical scholars about 1,200 years to catch up to the Quran here. In fact, scriptural alteration of the Torah is admitted in the Tanakh itself. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 8.8, 8, ready? It says, how can you say we are wise and we have the Torah Adonai, the law of God? And then in Hebrew it says, Hine le sheker asa eight sheker sofrim. The false pens of the scribes have turned it, the Torah, into a lie. Now, how do modern rabbinical authorities deal with these cherem passages? This is really important, right? It's really three ways. So we have the normative Jewish opinion. Right? So there are 613 commandments, mitzvot, in the Torah, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. The first commandment, the first mitzvah, is Genesis 1.28, get married and produce children. Okay. Um, the mitzvah to commit cherem in the Holy Land is uh, one of the 613 mitzvot in the Torah. It's number 528 of 613, according to the numbering of Maimonides. It says, leave none alive of the seven nations. And this is taken directly from Deuteronomy 20 that I quoted earlier. Six of the seven nations are mentioned in the next verse. Deuteronomy 20.17, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. There's another group called the Girgashites, as Rashi and others mention, uh, are also included to be exterminated. Now, Abraham ben Ezra and Rabbi Hezekiah ben Manoah and many others maintained that this mitzvah was limited only to the generation of Moses. Okay? So according to the traditional understanding, Cherem of the seven nations was only for that time, at that place, and never again. And the reason is because these groups are gone. They no longer exist. So while the 613 mitzvot are believed to be perennial and perpetual, right, transhistorical, there is simply no application of this mitzvah because these groups are gone. As Maimonides says, if even, uh, e uh, if even descendants of these groups remain unto today, mixed among other nations, as long as their evil culture has gone, their idolatry, their child sacrifice, their immorality, then the mitzvah remains fulfilled and there is no application. So this is traditional Judaism. Now, it is important to mention that almost no critical historians of the Bible believe that such a massive extermination of these nations ever really took place. Right? These stories are exaggerations. They're really intended as scare tactics. 
They function to scare the enemies of Israel, as well as to give hope to the Israelites. What actually happened to these groups? These groups migrated, they assimilated, they converted. Yes, there was wars and battles from time to time. But this kind of wholesale genocide, probably not. But what matters is belief, right? And the Orthodox take these stories literally. They believe them to be historically true, as did most eminent, um, the most eminent Christian scholars, from Augustine to uh, Aquinas to John Calvin, from the East and the West. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit. Okay. Now another opinion says that Cherem in the Holy Land will happen one more time at that place, but only when the Messiah comes. Okay, so they must wait for the Messiah. All right, they call him Mashiach ben Melek, Mashiach Melek ben David, the King Messiah, son of David. So only the Messiah can begin this process of kibbutz galut, the regathering of the Jews from diaspora, reestablishing the Jewish state. He'll fight the milchamat Adonai, as I mentioned earlier, the wars of the Lord, etc., etc. The third opinion is a, posi is a position of religious Zionism, the position of the Tzionot Datit. There has been a consistent and sustained sentiment among religious Zionist Jews that the Palestinians are the modern-day Canaanites. This very common sentiment among the religious Zionists. Therefore, given this notion of the beginning of the redemption, it is the religious duty of the government of Israel to wage a war of extermination against the Palestinian people. And this is what we are seeing right now in all of its horror. This is radical Judaism. They are preparing the land for their Messiah. So I encourage people to look up Gush Emunim, the Coalition of the Faithful. This was an uh, ultra-nationalist, orthodox Zionist movement found in the 1970s in Israel, uh, founded by students of uh, Yehuda Kuk, uh, director of the Merkaz Arav, and the son of the famous, the infamous, I should say, Rabbi Abraham Kuk. In the minds of these religious Zionists, the Israeli government has a religious duty to implement mitzvah f number 528 and utterly destroy the Palestinians in some form or fashion. They believe that the coming of their Mashiach can be hastened through a continued aggression, conquest, and settlement of Palestinian, Palestinian territories. And this aggression will culminate in the coming of their Messiah. As an organization, Gush Emunim no longer exists, but their ideology has permeated government officials in Israel. Gush Emunim also championed what's known as the Greater Israel Project, Eretz Yisrael Hashlema. This idea that it is the religious duty of the Israeli government to fully annex all Palestinian territories as these constitute greater Israel. Mir Kahana and Baruch Goldstein were staunch advocates of greater Israel. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, I mentioned that earlier as well. Yeah. I'll come back to that though in a minute, inshallah. And guess what? The political party known as Halikud is full of extremely dedicated religious Zionists and greater Israel advocates. Of course, Likud's chairman is Netanyahu, who has also been prime minister of Israel since 2009. And so he's surrounded by these radical Jews. Here's something interesting. It was widely reported that when Netanyahu was the, was the Israeli ambassador to the UN in the 1980s, the famous Rebbe of the, Ch of the Chabad Hasidic dynasty, named Menachem Mendel Schneerson, told him that he, Netanyahu, would be the Prime Minister of Israel when the Messiah arrives. In 1990, and this is documented, somebody sent me a YouTube video of this, <laughs> Schneerson commanded Netanyahu to do more to hasten the coming of the Mashiach. He said, what are you doing? There's a few hours left in the day. What have you done? Oh, working on it. This is 1990. Schneerson died in 1994. And by the way, many Zionists consider Greater Israel to be all of the land between the two rivers, the Nile and Euphrates. And this is based upon a passage in Genesis 15. So Gaza, West Bank, Golan Heights, that is the tip of the iceberg. Greater Israel, half of Egypt, all of the Levant, half of Iraq. The Israeli flag might even depict this. Some say this is a conspiracy theory. Right? That's how they want to, if, you, if you're labeled a conspiracy, it's called a thought stopper. People who think outside the box, right? In other words, smart people. They're, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, and that's supposed to stop their thinking. Oh, I don't want to be that. When you think about it, everything's a conspiracy anyway, right? 
Everyone's a conspiracy theorist. But if you look at the Israeli flag, there are two blue lines, the two rivers, and then a Star of David in the middle, Nile, Euphrates. So the radical Zionist Jews believe that they can use divinely sanctioned violence to essentially prepare the land for the Messiah, for the coming of the Geula, the messianic redemption. They can get the ball moving before his arrival. They can start the process, the Messiah will finish it. And again, we, say, we see that the plain and obvious policy that the Israeli government as a whole is applying to the Palestinians in Gaza, as well as the West Bank, because they want the Temple Mount, this policy cannot be described as anything other than cherem. This is cherem in 2023. They are preparing the land for the Messiah. They're offering their king a massive human sacrifice. Professor uh, Roz Siegel, professor at Stockton University, Israeli journalist. He's Israeli. He specializes in Holocaust and genocide studies. In his expert opinion, what Israel is doing right now to the Palestinians is, quote, a textbook case of genocide. Textbook genocide. And he cites a UN's definition of genocide. Pape calls it incremental genocide. Zionists will say, that's ridiculous. This is not genocide. If it were genocide, Israel would just kill everyone right now. <laughs> Besides, there are a million Arabs who live in Israel right now, outside of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. No one is killing them. So such ignorance fails to recognize that genocide is a process. It took the Nazis years to get to the final solution. Things don't happen overnight. So here's Article 2 of the UN's Genocide Convention. Genocide means any, any, of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in part or in whole, uh, sorry, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, such as A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in part or in whole, sorry, I always mix those up, in whole or in part, <laughs> D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Can we shut that door, please? And E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Israel fulfills all five. One of these constitutes genocide. All five. Dr. Siegel also points out that there are two essential elements here that qualify this as a genocide. Number one, special intent with dehumanizing language. I'll get to some of that. Number two, conditions to bring about the destructions of the group. That is to say, the dynamics of violence on the ground. So things like cutting off food, water, electricity, destroying hospitals, ambulances, mosques, churches, refugee camps, abandoning babies in hospitals. According to Pape, every 10 minutes a Palestinian child is murdered. So there is the rhetoric, the reality, and the capacity. All three are present. Israel uses the language of genocide. They, they make rap songs about it. They make children sing about it. It implements the structures of genocide, and it has a capacity to commit genocide. So speaking of special intent with dehumanizing language, here's a quote from Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. This was on October 9th. Quote, I have ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. No electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals. We are acting accordingly. We will eliminate everything. That is called cherem. Okay? We must get to know this word and educate people about this. We heard about jihad, jihad, jihad ad nauseum after 9-11. Why have we not heard of cherem? Why is it that in 2004, my non-Muslim neighbor was asking me to explain taqiyya? But in 2023, most of us have no idea about cherem or amalek. We'll talk about that little doozy in a minute. How is it that for several years after 9-11, whenever I would participate in interfaith dialogues, I was constantly bombarded with, in several churches and community centers by non-Muslims about jihad? I've probably answered a jihad question hundreds of times, that we are still ignorant of Chedem and Amalek. Why don't we know these concepts? I remember once in a Q&A session during an interfaith event, okay, a man in the audience, he started arguing with me about jihad. He was a Christian. He wanted to correct me about jihad. So I said to him, you know, I'll explain jihad to me when you explain Chedem. And he said, what's that? I do. He wanted to correct me some, about something in my tradition, but he doesn't know something found in his own religion, his own scripture, his own tradition. So I think it's time for us to push back a little bit. It's time for us to demand answers. We are constantly putting ourselves in a defensive position. 
It's time to expose the double standard in a more robust way. The present policy cannot be the new normal because, let's call a spade a spade, what is happening to the Palestinians right now is sheer terrorism. Zionism, as, this, as deployed by Israel, is radical Judaism, and radical Judaism is terrorism. Let's not forget, the persecution of the Palestinians at the hands of the radical Jewish elements goes back to 1917, way before October 7th, 2023. This did not start on October 7th. That's like saying the Nat Turner slave revolt in 1831 started black-white conflict in America. That's asinine. Gallant called the Palestinians human animals. Now, there is a consistent teaching in orthodox circles that there is an essential difference between Jews and Gentiles. This cannot be denied. None other than Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, as we said, one of the founders of religious Zionism, infamously advanced the opinion that the difference between a Jewish soul and a Goy soul is greater than the difference between a human soul and a cow soul. Other authorities say the Jew has two souls, a nefesh ha-behamit, a nefsul bahimiya, and a nefesh ha-elohut, nefsul ilahiya. But the Gentile only has a bahimiya. He's an animal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكَ كَتَبْنَا عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا ولقد جاءتهم رسلنا رسلنا بالبينات ثم إن كثيرا منهم بعد ذلك في الأرض في الأرض المسرفون that we had enjoined upon the children of Israel that whoever murders someone is as if they've murdered the whole of humanity, and if they save someone's life, is as if they've saved the whole of humanity. Verily, our messengers came to them with clear guidance, but a great part of them, many of them, are in the earth extremists. So here's the difference between traditional Judaism and radical Judaism in this ayah. Everything is in the Quran. Everything is in the Quran. Ibn Abbas or Ibn Umar, one of them, he said, if I lose the halter on my camel, I can find it in the Quran. That means everything is in the Quran. I find all my answers in the Quran. This special intent of genocide is on full display when you listen to Israeli politicians and military officers. These Zionist hijackers of Judaism, these Jewish radicals, the, IDF, the official IDF spokesman, Daniel Hagari, said, quote, the emphasis is on damage, not on accuracy. Is this defensive? This is minimizing collateral damage. This is surgical uh, you know, precision in fighting the enemy. No, the intention is to maximize collateral damage. He admits it. One more time, the emphasis is on damage, not on accuracy. This is not some pundit on Fox News. This is the official IDF spokesman. The former prime minister on, of Israel, Naftali Bennett, when asked about Palestinian babies in hospital incubators who need electricity to survive, he said the following, are you seriously talking about Palestinian civilians? Uh, I'm quoting him directly, by the way. Are you seriously talking about Palestinian civilians? We are fighting Nazis. I'm not feeding electricity or water to my enemies, end quote. Isaac Herzog, the president of Israel, Direct quote, ready? He's the president of Israel. It is not true, this rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. In other words, there is no distinction among Palestinians. All of the Palestinians are aware and involved in terrorism. We can slaughter them en masse. Marav Ben Ari, Israeli uh, politician and Knesset member. The children of Gaza have brought this upon themselves. And this is a woman speaking. What happened to this woman? Zionism happened. Avigdor Lieberman, Israeli politician, member of parliament, he tweeted the following. There are no innocents in Gaza. Does it get any more clear? Is this a war against Hamas or Palestine? Here, recently a top UN official, Craig McIver, resigned 
He was a director of the New York office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights. Here's a quote from him. The current wholesale slaughter of the Palestinian people rooted in an ethno-nationalist colonial settler ideology. In continuation of decades of their systematic persecution and purging, based entirely upon their status as Arabs, and coupled with explicit statements of intent by leaders in the Israeli government and military, leaves no room for doubt. He means that it's genocide. He continues, what's more, the governments, United States, United Kingdom, Europe, are wholly complicit in the horrific assault. Of course, America gives $4 billion a year to Israel. Recently, Biden approved $15 billion to Israel. $15 billion to be used for genocide. Tanks, missiles, white phosphorus. Imagine what that money could do for Americans. Poor Americans, poor families who can not even afford food or gas due to massive inflation. Instead, we got Joe, the Manchurian candidate, Biden, parroting Israeli talking points line after line, as Dr. Rashid Khalidi says, line after line, parroting Israeli talking points. Now, what's interesting is that modern uh, <clears throat> anti-Zionist activities, um, sorry, activists, have been recently citing studies that demonstrate that Levantine Arabs, including Palestinian Arabs, have genetic continuity with ancient Canaanites. In other words, they are descendants of Canaanites. Why are anti-Zionists highlighting these studies? Well, this relates to the debate about the land, right? Who was there first, right? As one Zionist put it, the word Jew comes from Judea. The word Arab comes from Arabia. So who's occupying whose land? In other words, the Jews were there first. But now, these recent studies are being cited to show that the Palestinians are actually descendants of the ancient Canaanites who were there before, the Israelites. Even Philip Jenkins says it is, quote, without doubt that the Palestinians are descendants of the Canaanites. But we can only imagine how this argument can actually embolden the religious Zionists of Israel. You see, they admit they're Canaanites. It's our duty to wipe them out. They admit it. Let's implement Mitzvah 528. The religious Zionists will use this to further galvanize their murderous base. What's up with the Canaanites? You know, as Muslims, it's time for us to know some Bible. Come on. I, think you want to, <laughs> I can't tell you how many Muslims in the past said, brother, you shouldn't read this. This is cool for this bit of. The Bible is the key to understanding what religious Zionists are doing right now. This all goes back to Genesis 9. It's called the Curse of Canaan. Have you heard of this? In Genesis 9, we are told that sometime after the flood, Noah got drunk, a stuff at Allah, and passed out in his tent naked. His sons, Shem and Japheth, covered their father's nakedness. But Ham did not. When Noah woke up, he said, Cursed be Canaan! A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Who is Canaan? The son of Ham. The supposed progenitor of the Canaanites. Now, the basic consensus of biblical historians today maintains that the book of Genesis was written hundreds of years after Musa a.s. Genesis was written by multiple authors across multiple centuries, starting around 1000 BCE. Study something called the Documentary Hypothesis or the Supplementary Hypothesis. In other words, Genesis was written during a time when the ancient Israelites were engaging militarily with the ancient Canaanites. Okay, the people who were indigenous to ancient Palestine. So this story about Noah and the curse of Canaan was written to serve as a piece of political propaganda. It served to insult and dehumanize the Canaanites, to make them easier to enslave and kill. This was not written by Moses, peace be upon him, by consensus of historians. The point was to say, even Noah cursed these people. Genesis 19, same thing. We're told that two daughters of Lot got their father drunk, then assaulted him, and they both got pregnant. The son of the older daughter was named Moab. The son of the younger daughter was named Ben-Ami. The author of Genesis then says, Moab is the father of the Moabites that you see today. And Ben-Ami is the father of the Ammonites that you see today. You see the Moabites and the Ammonites were two tribes that were fighting the ancient Israelites. Genesis 19 served to bastardize and slander these tribes to justify Israelite aggression against them. These Moabites, these Ammonites, they're all descendants of incest. They're illegitimate people. Don't feel bad about acting with violence towards them. That's the whole point. Now, there are two more mitzvot that deserve our immediate and undivided attention. Mitzvah number uh, 604, 
cut off the seed of Amalek. That is, destroy them utterly, commit cherem against Amalek. And 605, um, and both of these are taken from Deuteronomy 25.19, blot out the mention of Amalek, but also don't forget Amalek. Extremist messianic Israeli settlers often invoke Amalek as a justification for the massacre and displacement of the Palestinian people. Okay, now who or what is Amalek? Amalek was the first nation to fight against the Israelites according to the Torah, Exodus 17. They're also called the Amalekites. In 1 Samuel 15, King Saul was ordered by God to commit cherem against the Amalekites to exterminate their men, women, children, and animals. Total extermination. King Saul, however, spared their king. His name was Agag. Now, in the book of Esther, chapter 3, we're told that Haman, the Persian minister of Xerxes, was an Agagite. In other words, he was a descendant of Agag. In other words, he was an Amalekite. And Haman wanted to exterminate the Jews. So this is the MO of the Amalekites. They want to destroy Israel. Okay. Now, the Torah also says, the Lord will be at war against Amalek from generation to generation, Exodus 17, 16. Medur, dur means from generation to generation. In other words, forever, perpetual warfare against Amalek. The Lord declares perpetual warfare against Amalek. Now, modern traditional Jews, they tend to interpret these commandments against Amalek on strictly genealogical grounds. In other words, any and all descendants of Amalek must be killed, irrespective of their culture. This is why when it comes to the seven nations, you know, the, the, the Canaanites, broadly speaking, you can actually convert to Judaism or become a Ben Noach. You can adopt the seven Noahidic laws. But there's difference of opinion about uh, the conversion of an Amalekite. There's difference of opinion as to whether he should be allowed to convert or not. If not, he should be killed. However, Many would argue, since it is impossible to identify who is a true Amalekite, this commandment simply cannot be fulfilled. So Maimonides limits the application of this mitzvah to destroy Amalek to a Jewish king. In other words, only an anointed Jewish king can carry out this mitzvah. In other words, the Messiah. And other uh, authorities are more explicit about that. It only applies to the reign of the Messiah after he's taken full possession of the land, etc. However, common among Jewish Zionists is this horrible and disturbing teaching that the term Amalek refers to any enemy of the Jews in any generation. The mindset of Amalek, the mentality of Amalek, the culture of Amalek continues perpetually. They say the Midot, the Midot of Amalek, which means the characteristics of Amalek. So the Romans were the Amalek of their day. The Nazis were the Amalek of their day. Hey, you understand? So what does that mean? They have to find an Amalek in every generation. There's a Jewish professor at UCLA, a Zionist, Deborah Lipstad. She famously referred to, Jew, uh, to British historian of German history, David Irving, as, quote, a contemporary Amalek. In other words, he deserves to be killed for his views on history. This is a dog whistle. You understand? In other words, it contains a message that only a few people can understand. But now we understand. Now, guess upon whom? The modern Zionists apply this designation more than any other. Well, broadly, anyone who argues for the dissolution of the modern state of Israel, anyone who argues against the legality of the modern nationalistic apartheid state of Israel, uh, apartheid according to even Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Jimmy Carter, but more specifically, Iran has been called Amalek. So like a month ago or something, the Israeli minister of economy, his name is Nir Barkat, he threatened to, quote, wipe Iran off the face of the earth, his words. And then we have these neocon war hawks in our government, the American government, who have this unconditional obedience to Israel and do nothing but escalate the situation. And now they're recycling all of this 9-11 rhetoric about the axis of evil, etc. But here's another quote going back to Amalek, the modern Amalek. The former director of Israel Land Authority, Benzi Lieberman, said this in 2004. He's the director. Okay, so these are people in positions of power. Quote, the Palestinians are Amalek. We will destroy them. So now you understand what he means. He's invoking cherem, genocide, of the Palestinian people. This goes back to Plan Dalet in 1948. So these are religious extremists drunk on messianic fervor, and they are trying to inaugurate their messianic age with a massive human sacrifice, a gift to their king. 
And I truly believe, again, that Jewish people who are good, just, compassionate, I believe that when the real Messiah comes, they will believe in him and follow him. When Isa bin Maryam السلام, returns, the good people will follow him. Okay? Um, and that's that verse in the Quran we talked about earlier. Ah, here's something crazy. I gave a lecture on October 27th, and I mentioned Amalek and these things. A lot, you know, news for most people in the audience. The very next day, BB himself. You must remember what Amalek has done to you. It's a dog whistle. The initiated know what he means. Now we know what he means. He also made this appeal to their 3,000 year legacy, going back to Joshua, the son of Nun. Right? According to the Tanakh, Joshua ben Nun implemented cherem against the ancient Canaanites. Interestingly, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, who is an anti Zionist rabbi and follower of the late Rabbi Teitelbaum, he said that, that there is no street in all of Jerusalem named after Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Moses. The naming begins with Joshua. The reason, according to him, is because religious Zionists believe that Judaism actually started with the seizing of the land. Not with Abraham, not with Moses, not with the covenant at Sinai. No, for them, Joshua is essentially the founder of Judaism. So Netanyahu mentions Joshua, not Abraham, not Moses. And this guy Netanyahu even blamed the Holocaust on the Palestinians. This was years ago. He claimed that Hitler just wanted to exile them. But when Hitler met with Mufti Amin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Palestine, the Mufti convinced Hitler to exterminate the Jews. Norman Finkelstein, a Jewish professor whose parents survived Nazi death camps, his father was at Auschwitz, Finkelstein said that this claim is, quote, beyond lunacy. Netanyahu blamed the Holocaust on the Palestinians. He's lost it. What else does the Torah say about Amalek? 2519, you must blot out the very mention of Amalek from under the sky. You must blot out the very mention, the very mention of Amalek. And the word in Hebrew here is zikr. It's the same word, zikr. Right now in Western public discourse, there is a disturbing trend. Any defense of the Palestinian people is being branded as supporting terrorism and anti-Semitic. Why this trend? Well, the remembrance of Amalek, the very mention of Amalek, must be blotted out. And for these Zionist extremists and zealots, Palestine is Amalek. And Western mainstream media, let's be honest, is totally controlled by Zionist propaganda. So now, just having a Palestinian flag is seen as supporting terrorism and hating Jews. People are losing their jobs across multiple industries for even uttering a word of support for Palestinian lives, for speaking out against the carpet bombing of civilians. The House passed Resolution 894, which makes anti-Zionism anti-Semitic. American politicians are scared of death, scared to death of offending Jews. Meanwhile, in Gaza, Palestinian families, listen to this, are debating about whether they should all stay in one place or split up. Because if they split up and Israel drops bombs, at least the entire family won't be killed. This is what Palestinians are doing right now. This is their discussion over dinner. Palestinian parents are writing the names of their children on their children's bodies in case, if they're bombed, they can identify them. This is what Palestinians are doing right now. Gazans right now are slowly starving. They're living in extremely close quarters with limited water, which means that disease is about to spread. This is all a strategy of war deployed by, deployed by Israel, and they admit this. And of course, the Zionists release fake images, fake recordings, Look up the Hannibal Directive. God knows what they can do with AI. We have this Israeli actress pretending to be a Palestinian Muslim nurse in the Al-Shifa hospital. Fake tears, speaking English with a Hebrew accent. Horrible acting. It's all tricksterism. We're told that there was a Hamas command and control center under the major hospital. Total lie. The Jerusalem Post went with this narrative that Palestinians are using dolls like fake dead babies. This was debunked. They retracted the story. No apology. These are real babies. These are real human beings. You see, Israel has to manufacture consent because the truth is not with them. I'll say it again. Read the Bible. Read Genesis. Just read Genesis. The person of Jacob. In the book of Genesis, okay, this is the Torah, not the Quran. In Genesis, Jacob is a master trickster who, no matter what he does, God continues to bless him. He has unconditional divine support for his deception. 
And Jacob is also called Israel. Jacob is Israel. From the very beginning of his life until the very end of his life, he's tricking people, deceiving people. And at the end of the book of Genesis, even Jacob's son, Joseph, ends up tricking the Egyptians. He tricks them and ends up enslaving the Egyptians. I don't remember reading that in the Quran. The Quran corrects these false narratives. Right at the beginning of Surah Yusuf. But Genesis is the primary text of Judaism. And they say, as they say, if such are the clergy, then God bless the congregation. If one of the greatest patriarchs described in the most sacred book, who is also the namesake of their nation, was a master trickster, what do we expect from Zionist Israel? This, is the, this was the motto of Mossad, this is Israeli, uh, Israel's National Intelligence Agency. This used to be, the, they changed it, but it was, uh, by deception, you may wage war. Ajib. They're telling us everything. What actually happened on October 7th? How many civilians were killed? It was 1,400, then they said 1,200. 1100, no babies were beheaded, no women were raped, no people were burned alive and tortured, no babies thrown in ovens. There's no evidence of this. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz said there's no evidence of this. Israeli newspaper. However, there is evidence that Israeli Apache helicopters fired hellfire missiles at cars and Israeli tanks shelled Israeli homes, causing the death of many, many Israeli civilians. At Kibbutz Be'eri, an eyewitness named Yasmin Porat, an Israeli woman, said that she saw the IDF kill Israeli civilians. What about these released hostages? Why were they so nice and pleasant with their Hamas captors? Shaking hands, smiling, saying shalom as they left. Oh, they had Stockholm Syndrome. Why don't Palestinian ho hostages and detainees have Stockholm Syndrome? Palestinian hostages are returned broken and battered. Why do we rarely hear from these released Israeli hostages? The reason is because their first-hand testimony contradicts the Israeli narrative. And the horrible aspect of this is that I have heard otherwise decent and moral people defend Israel's attack on Palestine. They say, this is not the same as Hiroshima or Nagasaki. In Hiroshima, the express purpose was to target civilians. But in Palestine, the Israeli military says that they don't intend to kill civilians. It just happens on accident. So it's okay. Civilians are killed on accident. Absolute nonsense. And how incredibly disturbing. According to that logic, Israel could kill, in theory, a million children and say, oh, that wasn't our intention. So for these cowardly apologists for Israel, we need to ask them, when will it be enough for you to grow a backbone and condemn Israel? How many more children have to be cut to pieces? How many whole families taken off the planet before you grow a backbone and condemn what is obviously a genocide? If a Hamas fighter was hiding in a hospital in Tel Aviv, would Israel blow up that hospital in Tel Aviv? Of course not. But in Palestine, yes, there was a Hamas fighter. Everyone else was killed on accident, wink, wink. They think we're stupid. They just shoehorn Hamas in there, and it makes genocide A-OK. -okay. This is collective punishment, and collective punishment illegal according to international law. Israel violates the principle of proportionality, the principle of distinction, and the principle of precaution. How many laws are they breaking? No, Finkelstein said it. Quote, they are using October 7th as a pretext for the final solution to the Gaza problem. Chris Hedges, he says, Israel's goal is to turn Gaza into a moonscape. You've seen what the moon looks like. The goal is to annex Gaza. They keep recycling this human shields argument. This is based, this is based, their bread and butter. First of all, Israel uses human shields. They allow settlers, civilians, to live on occupied territories, stolen land, right next to Israeli military bases. They are putting people in harm's way. They're using settlers as human shields. Let's pretend that someone commits murder and runs into your house and hides somewhere in your house uh, and that the police know he's in your house, okay? So the police call you and say, get out of your house because we're going to blow it up. You say, wait a minute. Why would you destroy my home? We have nowhere else to go. Why don't we exit our house 
and you can send cops to find this guy, pull him out, and arrest him. No, your choice is leave your house so we can bomb it, or stay and we'll bomb it. So they bomb the house. And then the police blame the murderer for your death and the death of your family. He was using them as human shields. How stupid is that? These people are clowns. This is asinine. So I'll end with this. Deception is everywhere. The Western media is gaslighting the world. The oppressed are depicted as the oppressors and vice versa. It's like the world is under a spell. It's very strange. This is a beautiful dua from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that we should recite during these times. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa rizuqna ittiba'a. Oh Allah, <coughs> show us the truth as truth and give us the ability to follow it. Wa arina al-ba'atila ba'atilan wa rizuqna ijtinaba. And show us falsehood as falsehood and give us the ability to reject it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to see through the smoke and mirrors. So there's a hadith, Sunan Abu Dawood, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Man sami'a bit dajjal falyan'a anhu fa wallahi inna rajula layatihi wa huwa yahsibu annahu mu'minun fa yattabi'uhu mimma yub'athu bihi min ashubuhat. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Let him who hears of the Dajjal, the imposter Messiah, keep a distance from him, for I swear by Allah that a man will come to him thinking he's a firm believer and end up following him because of confused ideas, heretical matter, shubuhat, roused in him by the Dajjal. Don't fall for this Orwellian, weird Israeli speak. The tribulation of the imposter Messiah is sharru fitnatin, the most evil of tribulations. So this is serious business. Can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yata'awwadhu min adabi jahannam wa adabi qabr when Masih al-Dajjal, the Prophet used to seek refuge in Allah from the punishment of hell, the punishment of the grave, and from the imposter Messiah. Of course, the Prophet is free of all these things, but he's teaching us by example. So protect yourself against the Antichrist. The Prophet said, Ad-du'a silahul mu'min. There's some weakness in the hadith, but it's true in its meaning. We pray for the people of Gaza, pray for their souls, pray for yourselves. Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran. Allah says, save yourselves and your families from the fire. Hold fast to the kitab and sunnah. Establish the prayer. Don't leave the prayer. Okay. Remember what we said at the beginning of the seminar? Our state and the world will not change until we realize and take it to heart that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can help us. When we turn to Allah with all of our being, then our conditions will improve. When we realize that the only opinion that matters is Allah's opinion, then things will change. No one else is really going to help us. Everything else is a band-aid. We are neither right nor left on the political spectrum. We're Muslim. We're neither blue pill nor red pill. We're green pill. There are so-called free speech conservatives who want to ban things like TikTok because it spreads anti-Zionism. Now, I'm no fan of TikTok, but isn't that ironic? Loyalty to Zionism trumps the First Amendment Many conservatives are Darbian dispensationalists who have unconditional, pathetic obedience to Israel. There's your right wing. How's the left wing doing? Recently, an Obama national security advisor verbally unloaded on a poor Arab halal truck vendor in New York. You see this? This was Obama's guy. Obama, right? This is what we're told. Barack Hussein, Obama, he's with us. In Farsi, Obama means he's with us. Obama, Barack Hussein, Obama. What happened? So this Obama advisor said that the death of 4,000 Palestinian children was not, this was weeks ago, 10,000 now. That's not enough, he said. And then he openly slandered the Prophet Muhammad wasallam with a big smile on his face. Here's your left wing. None of these people are our allies. None of these people are our allies. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Learn this dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min a'dhabi jahannam wa min a'dhabi al-qabr wa min fitnati al-mahya wa al-mamat wa min sharri fitnati al-masih al-dajjal wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam muhammadin wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi wa bin alimu allahum musta'an assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we can take some questions 
Okay, we have um, two questions here on the sister side. Uh, we'll do them one at a time. The first question is, where does the word Zionism come from and who coined this term? Uh, so, good question. The word Zion, not Zionism comes from the Hebrew word Zion. Zion is one of the names of Jerusalem in the Bible. Zion. So, so one of the names in the Hebrew Bible. It means like a sunny place, a place where the weather is nice, something like that. Right, so it's a reference to Jerusalem. Uh, who who coined the term Zionism? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, next question: um, Are the names Israel and Jerusalem Hebrew words, and is the name Israel given to Palestine by Zionists? Israel, um, yeah, Israel is Hebrew. Uh, Yerushalayim. Some there's difference of opinion. Some say it's Hebrew, means city of peace. But there's different ways of actually pronouncing Jerusalem. So Yerushalayim means something, city of the two pieces, something like that. So there's an opinion that actually pre-Israelite, uh, so it's some um, ancient Canaanite language. So that's an opinion. What was the second part of the question? Uh, is the name Israel given to Palestine by Zionists? Um, yeah, they called it Israel. Now. 2,000 years ago, um, um, the, the northern half of Palestine was called Israel, and the southern half was called Judea, right? So they want to revive that name, right? So this sort of gives them in their minds a, a claim to the land. They're just using the same name. It's the same name. That's, so we, sh we should be living there, right? It's like 2,000 years ago, we lived there. I mean, what people who imagine this, imagine like... Imagine like uh, you open the door and there's some Miwok Indians, Native Americans, some Alodi Native Americans standing at your door. And they say to you, forget about 2,000 years ago. 100 years ago, my, this was our land. Get out of my house. What would you do? You'd call the cops. And they say, oh, it's, it's, it's called Ohlone, the city, Ohlone College. It's the same name. Yeah, that, that means it's ours. Really? That's your argument? People are clowns, man. I have a question. Well, a, a couple of questions. Um, are the people in Israel and the people that are Palestinian, are they pretty much the same people? Because if you look at the time when Yusuf al-Islam went to Egypt and then Yaqub al-Islam went with him and the tribe went with him, they came back with Moses to their homeland, essentially, where they left. It's, aren't they not all the same people, essentially? Yeah, there's definitely genetic continuity among Arabs and Jews. So this is just a religious war? It's what? Just a religious war? Well people, well, people appeal to race. So the Zionists, they're appealing to, to race, right? They want to redefine Judaism as, as a Jewish race. That's it. That's original Zionism. That's secular Zionism. It has nothing to do with religion. Okay. What, what was the quote play again? That's a nice quote, right? Most Zionists don't believe in God, but they all believe that God gave them pa Palestine. <laughs> I see. And the second question was, you referred to some of the Christian sources here. Um, is there any source that goes back to like the original Bible, as close as it was? Uh, what was the last part? As close as possible. To the original Bible? Yeah. You, wh like, like, what do you the mean the original Bible, Bible that, that God revealed to Isa al-Islam? Oh. Um, well, it's a, it's a question that deserves a long answer. But in my opinion, I think uh, the original teachings of Isa a.s. to a certain degree can be extracted uh, from Matthew and Luke um, because they had a source in common called the Q source document. So take a class on Intro to the New Testament, this historical studies of the New Testament. You'll learn about something called Q. So this is a gospel, a sayings gospel. Dennis McDonald calls it the first gospel. Uh, that Matthew and Luke had access to. It's probably pre-Pauline. It's probably written in the 40s or 50s uh, that Matthew and Luke had access to. Mark did not. So whenever Matthew and Luke have material in common, it's probably from Q. And if you look at all the Q uh, uh, um, in information, the Q material, because we can sort of piece it together, none of it really contradicts Islam. And it's the earliest historical source that the gospel authors are using when writing their gospels. 
But as far as anything authentic from Isa salam, from our perspective, no, we don't have anything like that. Uh, I just want to ask two questions, maybe a little more if you don't mind. Um, so I know that the tribes of Israel, who are, they're just tribes of uh, Yaqub salam. And is it true that um, they did come from the Arabian Peninsula or have they always, well, essentially Canaanites did uh, historically come from the Arabian Peninsula. So is it possible that they're not a distinctive identity as being Jews because we know some Bani Israel were Muslims and some were Nasar and some were Yehud. So is, is that true or is that uh, a, like, a, like a theory that people have came up with? What is the theory again? That some Bani Israel, like Bani Israel, are not distinctly Jews. Like they are, some were Muslims, and and the majority they they went astray, and they were Nasara, like Christians and Jews and whatnot. I mean, according to our aq aqidah, um, the Muslims of the past, the 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 Yehud, the Yehud were the Muslims of the uh, of the past, right? They were the Muslim Ummah, right? So. Mm -hmm. The people of Musa alayhi salam, that, those were the Muslims. The, the people of Ibrahim alayhi salam, those were the Muslims. I see. Yeah. So, if you're asking when did, when did the sort of term Jew as a religious distinction come about, this is much later. So, in other words, what were the people of, uh, uh, the Israelites at the time of Musa alayhi salam, what was the name of their religion? This is a, this is a good question. Nobody knows. What did they call themselves? Uh, Samaritans. Like, like if, if Musa alayhi salam, if I were to speak to Musa alayhi salam and I said to him, are you a Jew? He would say, uh, no, I'm a Levite. So he would think I'm referring to a tribe. Right? I said, no, no, no. Are you, do you practice Judaism? He would say, well, what is that? There's, it's anachronism. Right? So what's the name of your religion? And I actually asked a rabbi one time. I said, if I were to ask Musa alayhi salam, Moshe, right? Shalom ha'alayf. That's they also say alayhi salam. I uh, say of blessed memory. If I asked him, what is your religion? What would he say? And he actually said to me, he'd probably say something like shalom or Islam or something like that. But Judaism as a religious, dis a religious distinction is a second temple period. This is like, this is way like hundreds of years later. So that was interesting. You said the rabbi said he would, that Musa alayhi salatu salam, he would say that he was a Muslim or in their language, is, uh, what was it, shalom? Shalom, yeah, it means peace, like some sort of submission unto God. I see, right. Yeah. I mean, that's the, 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 the origin of Islam is Islam. Yeah, so they have be. Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic have common roots. Yeah. So like Jews, when they meet, they say, shalom aleichem. Right, that's our greeting. That's how Isa alayhi salam would have greeted the disciples. And jazakallah uh, khair. And the second question is, is it true that uh, there is this there, there's this group they call themselves Samaritans? Mm. I don't know if you've heard of them, but the Samaritans. Some people argue that they follow a true version of the Torah. Now we believe that the Torah and the Injil and the Book of Zabur, which is known as or possibly the Book of Psalms, um, we we believe that they have been corrupted and truly they have been corrupted. Uh, as the previous brother was asking, is there remnants, like very few remnants, that could suggest that the, the truth remained, but mostly it was corrupted, or is it completely corrupted, like we can't find anything? There's, there's, we can only confirm things in ma'ana. So, for example, Deuteronomy 6 4 says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Here are Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's a true meaning, right? God is one, Echad, Ahad. But is that exactly what Musa alayhi salam said? I, I don't know. I, there's no sanad. So we can confirm the ma'ana, but not, not the laf, not the nas. The nas, we, don't, we have no sanad. So Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, rahimahullah, he says, when you look at the Bible, there's really three categories of these Israeliyat, right? He says there are things that are true in their meaning, and we can affirm those meanings. And there are things that are clearly false in their meanings, and we deny them, and there's a lot of gray area. But nothing we can say with 100% definitive reliance, as it were, it, that this is definitely from Wahi. We don't know. The Samaritan version of the Torah is basically the same as the Masoretic text, 
which is the sort of uh, received text that is used by Jews the world over, is basically the same. There are some differences in spelling and word order and things like that. Sometimes there's different descriptions, but it's basically the same. Now, the Samaritans, they do pray in an unusual way. They actually, when they pray, they make ruku and, and sajda, and they say this is from Musa alayhi salam, Allahu alam. Uh, um, so, that's why I preface this uh, with, um, when I go on social media, I, I'm, you know, first generation Muslim American here, uh, Middle Eastern background, my mom is from Mecca, my dad Lebanese, and I grew up in a kind of Republican area, so I, I understand what it's like to have to be on the defensive, especially during 9-11, or, um, and my mom was running for political office, and, you know, and, um, any, anyway, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm actually pleasantly surprised on one hand when I go to social media, like even Instagram, you know, I, know, I didn't used to like a lot of these, you know, social media stuff, but it is a way to connect with people who are um, trying to, you know, convey an idea, obviously. Um, so I noticed that one thing I like to do I think it's important to even like like Malcolm X and a lot of people talk about is like learn learn from your enemy, right? Or like I consider you have to learn from the other side or what they're saying, so you know you know. So um, I would even look at like I knew, I used to watch a lot of you know a lot of the Jewish media uh, Hollywood shows like you know Seinfeld or whatever. So. Uh, even I noticed that one of these actresses, Deborah Messing, writes very Zionistic posts, and but see they they like to use they use this tactic of also getting you know some token Arab or Iranian or Muslim you know uh, to condemn you know or they'll say oh we're 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 pro Palestinian too, but as long as Hamas must release all the hostages, or um, so what I'm trying to get at is that I try to look at what they're saying too, so I know what you know. And and the good thing is that I start to see that if they do allow for people to post a lot of pro Palestinian, they jump on it, you know, and they write uh, you know you know the hypocrisy of it all. Uh, but like sometimes we have to under we have to be, like in debate right we have to learn even maybe as Muslims to play devil's advocate a little bit or sometimes I notice with some Israeli or the pro Zionist ones um, they want to say well oh the Arab world has all these countries Muslim country or you know Saudi is Muslim or da -da, why can't we just have our own state or you know or things like that so how do we answer that or um yeah all, you know those kind of things you know like yeah i mean I, I don't care if there's a jewish state it has nothing to do with me but you, you can't take someone else's country that's the problem and, and i don't think that's unreasonable to, to make that objection i don't care if there's a jewish state you know um but that's a question for their own tradition though they have an internal conflict because 150 years ago, they all believed that they're in exile. So they can, they can ask for traditional authorities, what's wrong with having a Jewish state? And you're going to get an, a very uh, substantive, religious, and moral, and ethical response to why. That can't be the case. Because Judaism is rooted in the fear of God, and God has put us in exile. If you don't believe in God, yeah, you can do whatever you want, basically. right? Um, but if you believe in God, then you're expected to fear God. You know. Um, so I don't know if that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you know, if I if I want something, if if I don't have a car because I can't afford one, can I steal your car? I mean, this is very basic. I mean, I have to explain these. Not not the, not I'm not you know. But sometimes we have to kind of break it down in a very basic way. Can I steal something if I don't have it? No, I can't. Maybe I can work with a person and say, hey, can I, can I have this? And we can, in, in goodwill, and maybe I can share something, or someone will give me something, something like that. You win the peace, you win with goodwill. But coming with violence and stealing, it's not gonna work. There's no tofik in that. And we've seen it. Like one of these guys, he, he tweeted, 
If there's no Israel, then Jews would be killed all over the world. What? The, the most dangerous place on earth for a Jew is Israel. It's exactly the opposite of the truth. So, uh, so I, I have a quick question about uh, the Dajjal. Because I'm thinking of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu which says every uh, prophet warned his people about the Dajjal. And I wonder if there's any traces of, of such a warning in the Jewish uh, scriptures, or do they have absolutely no uh, you know, mention of the Dajjal? Or not? What's their understanding of that concept? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, it's, it's nothing really sort of commensurate with our tradition. Uh, I mean, I get this question a lot. I would say the closest thing to an antichrist is this idea of Amalek in their tradition, right? That's, there's going to be a force in the world that wants to eradicate uh, Israel um, and that this force will be um, alive and well in the world when the true Messiah comes and will oppose the Messiah. So in that sense, it's the Antichrist, right? Um, so, and you know, they, they certainly don't like Isa alayhi salam. I don't know if they go so far. I mean, certainly he was a pseudo messiah, according to them. And, um, you know, if you read the Talmud again, don't read it, but, uh, you know, the way that he's described, depicted as someone who basically, you know, caused a lot of problems, to say it mildly. Shabtai Svi, another one of these, what they consider to be a, a false messiah who claimed to be the Messiah, and then he converted to Islam, and it was a big fiasco. So you have these pseudo-Messiahs, these kind of minor antichrists, but is there like this idea of a Dajjal, a singular sort of Messiah Dajjal? Um, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't come across anything like that. The closest thing is Amalek. And, and Amalek is, they refer to Amalek in the singular. They, don't, they usually don't say Amalekites. They say Amalek as if it's one person. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Uh, just one more question. Is it true that uh, yeah, we know that modern day Yehud, they mainly come from uh, Central Europe or at least the Ashkenazi. So we can no longer say that they are Semites since they've gone astray because they rejected the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophets. Uh, we can no longer claim that they are Semites. So we would be like if someone were to criticize them, it would be more like anti Jew, but not anti Semite. If, if that's a correct way to put it, since genetically they are no longer connected to the land of Canaan. Yeah, the, I, I spoke about that earlier as well. The, the Ashkenazim, there's there's difference of opinion. There are things that are no longer politically correct to say about them. Sort of traditional in the past, it was sort of um, um, proposed that they're converts, right? That the kingdom of Hazaria. Did I mention this? About Khazaria, I mentioned it earlier. Yeah. So what, I don't want to repeat myself. Just watch. I don't know if you're here or not. Just watch the recording and show. Okay, we'll go with one final question, kind of all-encompassing from the online viewers. What is the claim of Zionism overall? Is it primarily about land, religion, race, or is it all-encompassing? What is the claim of Zionism? Yeah, the overall claim, what are they claiming to? Is it race? Is it land? Is it religion? Is it all? And I think the question is towards a supremacy or overall encompassing ideology of Zionism. Well, I, it's, it's different things. It's, um, most Zionists are secular, right? Uh, so it's this idea that we need a Jewish homeland because of what happened in Europe. We had a horrible time. We need a safe haven for Jews. And again, I, I'm not against that. But the problem is when you go into a country that's already populated and you spread lies about that country and say, oh, this is a country without a people. No. I think any decent person, if they have any type of moral compass, would say, I'm against that. And including many, many Jews. Right? Jews united for Israel. Natura Karta. The Satmar. A lot of these rallies, pro-Palestinian rallies and events, they're, they're led by Jews, ethnic Jews, right? Uh, whether they're secular or religious. So people are using Palestine for their own purposes, some for religion, some for whatever. Um, uh, for immoral reasons in their minds, um, so some for political reasons. 
Yeah, as you can see, I'm getting a little bit tired now. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for attending. We'll see you soon. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.